Test, 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 test. Yeah. test. Yeah. We want to be able to hear you. Got it. Uh, and that thing will apply. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, and when we go yeah, around, uh, right. are you kind of like handling that moment? No, everyone is just going to kind of pass it off. Okay, cool. So, yeah, yeah, then once you're done with this, you'll hand it off to the first person. Yeah. Okay, cool. Can I take this? Thank you. It's on. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. I'm taking trouble in the closet. Yeah. Okay. You got this. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's Four Space. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event, which is part of the ongoing critical materialities discussion. This is called Invisible, Materializing Ecosystems Towards New Ethics of Making. Now, to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Four Space. And we are located on unceded indigenous lands in Chichage, Montreal. In the fourth space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge with daily activities, examining research questions, projects in development across the university. We're running this event as a live stream meeting also. So any comments or questions from anyone on Zoom, just pop them into the chat. Uh, we'll try and get those to whomever they are for. Those of you, of course, in the space, just reminding you that we'll be moving microphones around to try to get that to you so we can hear what you're saying. And with that, it's very much my pleasure to hand things over to Associate Professor in Design and Computational Arts, but also the Concordia University Research Chair in Critical Practices, Materials and Materiality, Alice Shari. Alice. All right, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for your presence this afternoon. Uh, thanks for uh, those uh, from yesterday who are uh, here this afternoon too. And thanks for the, to the team at Fort Space for the generous support uh, and the organization. This is uh, incredible. Um, and the class is uh, very grateful to have the chance to present uh, their project here. So welcome to Critical Materiality 2023 Public Mediation Event. So critical materiality is an advanced special topic uh, research studio course that opens up new perspective and develops joint methods between design and computation arts uh, disciplines, both graduate and undergraduate. With an emphasis on material engagement, making and process, uh, students develop objects, narratives, visuals, in installations, environments as artistic and public responses to social environmental topics. A large part of research creation or practice-based research uh, transpires in the form of sensory perception. So what happens uh, when the studio and our material practices move to public space here at Ford Space this year? How can design and computation art practices be communicated and experienced? How do we foster discussion in public settings? This public activity questions practice in relation to matter, materiality, media, objects, technologies, and techniques. Today, students will develop feedback loops between practical and theoretical ideas catalyzed in class. And while the core approach is to cooperate, experiment, discuss, and reflect in the public arena, this event involves rethinking the relationships between making and communicating research creation. So today we have Gabriel Archambault, Ali Steinberg, Saba Or, Beth Vince, Junior Vigneault, Megan Wake, Audrey Coulombe, Julie Kachim, Asmat Ishak, Elisabeth Breton, and Alison Dupont, who will present Invisible, Materializing Ecosystems Toward New Ethics of Making. I'd also like to welcome Mauricio Martinucci, aka Tez, artist uh, in residence at the Meteor Biolab at the moment, who will join the conversation a little bit later. So materials and the processes of making are intricately intertwined in invisible power systems, shaping our interactions and relationships with design processes and the ultimate form of design creations. Uh, 
The interplay of systems and material resonates across industrial, technological, ecological, textile production, and manufacturing domains such as data centers, con construction sites, and waste management. Our relationships to these complex systems uh, mold our perceptions and contributions to the world around us. Invisible, materializing ecosystems toward new ethics of making, ventures into new realms of materiality, navigating the nuances and alternative possibilities of creation within these concealed power structures. How can we productively engage with the failure, lags, gaps, and opacity of industrial and technological production systems? How can the materiality of objects help expose their invisible underlying power systems? How can we foster new sustainable relationships to materials and the environment through a material practice of critical awareness and care? Advocating for alternative modes of creation, our inquiry fosters an ethos of making that transcends the material realm, seeking to unravel immateriality through tangible engagement, performances, composites, and upcycle processes. Through a multidisciplinary exhibition of research creation project, Invisible invites the public to partake in a contemplative and explorative exploration of material practices. New materials are crafted to enhance our engagement and relationship with the, with the corporeal and constructed environments we inhabit, fashioning an alternative ethics of making that speaks to the intrinsic nature of our interconnected world. I will pass the mic, the mic to Beth Vince, who will uh, introduce the outline and the schedule of the day. Uh, I would like to invite people when we start the presentation to pick an object on the table and to keep them uh, along the presentations. Yeah. Okay, uh, hi everyone. So I'll just go over the schedule. So um, as Alice mentioned, we're gonna start by um, inviting everyone up to look at the objects and um, pick one to keep with you throughout the presentations and kind of think about how it relates to one of the presentations that you'll see. Um, we're going to go individually with presentations first, and then we're gonna have a short break where we have a little activity that we're gonna invite you all to participate in, and then we will come back and have some roundtable discussions. So without further ado, please come up and pick an object. I'm the closest. So. <laughs> I will let people pick first. Yeah, I just don't want to, yeah, I want to make sure everyone else, every, the audience gets to be Okay, so I think we'll start the presentations now and we're going to start with Gabby. So if we can all just come over here and then we're going to just move around the room. We'll get started with the presentations in just a minute. Uh, no, I think I have to But the, which questions? Like, like, it, like, it, like, it, like, it, like, it, Uh, okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I know this space is a little cramped, but um, so for my project, I decided to explore the impacts of my own practices on the environment. So while attempting to think in a sustainable light, I decided to concentrate on my painting practice. 
um, because I vaguely knew about the process involved in acquiring my oil paints and the difficulty of um, disposing of them. So through my research, I learned further information about what oil paints does to uh, or do to one's health as well as the environment. So to obtain oil paints, pigments uh, must be extracted and then chemically synthesized and refined. And then additives are then mixed uh, in to create a smooth, long-lasting texture. And then finally, the tubes are distributed and transported. So all these processes create toxic waste and require large amounts of energy, creating paints that are often not recyclable. And as well as the environmental impacts, oil paint releases um, volatile organic compounds that we breathe in, polluting the air and water supply with toxic toxics, toxicity. Sorry. Um, so this research led me to find case studies of artists that are also exploring similar things. Um, so I was inspired by Carbon Copies, uh, um, piece by Michelle Wang. Um, it's a project that critiques other artists that were making a statement about climate change while also creating a massive carbon footprint through the making of these pieces. So this irony inspired my project's concentration on um, exploration rather than the final result. And then two other projects also inspired me, which uh, were one called Kaiku. So that was exploring how air pressure can turn vegetable baths into pigment. And then also the Wild Pigment Project, which is an initiative to forage for pigments in an ethical and small scale uh, way. So thus began my uh, exploration. So I started collecting my food scraps from my everyday meals. And then, so that meant acquiring materials through a byproduct of my everyday life. So I tried two different methods. So the first involved boiling scraps to extract the pigment. Uh, and then the other one, um, involves placing scraps into the oven and then grinding them. So this are these ones. Uh, but the um, issue with the more dry pigments um, was that they weren't small enough and uh, they didn't create a vibrant color. Um, so I concentrated my efforts on the liquid pigments, which are seen here, but already mixed in with flour, which is a technique that I saw for making wall paint. Um, so I boiled the flour with the liquid pigment and then um, it turned into a thicker consistency. And then I also experimented with the pH levels, um, the reactivity of pH levels with cabbage, for example, which you can see in the bright colors here. Um, and then, so the last step of my project was to create a painting uh, displaying the ephemer ephemerality of my paints. So the paints don't last because they do expire. Um, and they're a product of everyday life. So depending on what you eat, the that's the color you get you can get. Um, so I thought it was fitting that the paints be displayed on skin where they can be washed away. And they also demonstrate the uh, non toxicity and that the paint is even edible. So these are the two pieces of art I created. They're not the best creations but they were just meant to display that there's different ways of creating more sustainable alternatives um and if during the break if you want to you can open the paints and try painting on this canvas to see the texture is quite clumpy and not what I initially wanted but it's I had to remind myself that it's about exploration and not final results Okay, so I guess it's my turn. Hi, everyone. I guess a lot of you here know me, but I'm Isabelle Breton, and personally, I'm a graphic designer. And as a graphic designer in the industry, I create a lot of digital projects. And with these digital projects comes multiple cycles of iterations until we finally find that best solution. So coming with this project I was uh I was asking myself where what happens to these virtual materials uh once they're no longer wanted or considered valuable so personally what I do in my own practice I have this little uh digital bank in my computer on a cloud server that I put all the 
so-called bad iterations into. And it over the years, it's developed and grown and it's become the sort of virtual graveyard of waste, virtual waste, digital waste. And uh, with this project, the first interest I was thinking of is how do I repurpose this virtual waste to somehow have a newfound value? Another interest was to take that virtual waste and sometimes it can be somewhat mundane, um, unwanted, not particularly interesting or pretty, how to take these things like emails, um, old photos, images, and adapt them, modify them into new artistic expressions. And then the third interest was um, to take these virtual waste materials and put them together in a final design output. Uh, so uh, yeah, I was mostly inspired by book art. So uh, people like Joanna Drucker and Suzanne B, as well as uh, just the natural processes of nature, uh, practices of care, and also the art movement of concrete poetry. And uh, I made this memorial catalog uh, composed of 15, uh, so like deceased, we could say deceased uh, digital projects that are composed of digital assets and email threads. The email threads were, um, let's say, re reimagined into obituaries and the digital assets were re-imaged as, um, as artistic collages. Uh, so reimagined and reimaged is what I call the project. And it's it's a final act of care for these virtual materials. And with this exhibition, I kind of imagined it as a wake or like a final celebration of life, hence all the candles, so people can come and appreciate them before they have to pass on to the afterlife. And uh, um yeah, uh, they and I'm giving them the agency to tell their own stories through their email threads and their visual representations as a final homage. So thank you for listening. Pass it on to um. Oh we. Oh sure, I can do that. Um, hmm, which one's a good one? Uh, the thing is that they were stochastically transformed by AI. I did not write these. I did edit them though, but. Uh, this one is called um, Type 2 Diabetes Prevention Challenge. It it was born on November 2022 and died January 20 and will die in January 2026. So it's not dead yet, but it will die. Uh, the world bids farewell to a cherished individual, Type 2 Diabetes Prevention Challenge, who orchestrated linguistic symphonies. With unmatched grace and precision, they conveyed 11 polished biographies, both in English and French. They enriched our lives with Dr. Shan Chug's snapshot, a testament to their dedication. A reply was delivered, a testament to their diligence, yet a minor omission in the English bio surfaced, lacking details on the esteemed jury members. Type 2 Diabetes Prevention Challenges Pursuit of Excellence prompted them to suggest reaching out to a fellow colleague for the updated file, or perhaps navigating the labyrinthine waters of deep bell translation. Their linguistic prowess, though unparalleled, navigating, uh, navigated even the trickiest curveballs with finesse. Type two diabetes prevention challenge, your dedication lives on, an enduring legacy in the world of words. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, on to the next one. Hello. Um, my project is Notions of Care, and for it, I made a jacket. Um, my process was not linear. I had to shift focus many times. Uh, I started my research looking at waterproofing textile technology and outdoor garments. Uh, PFAs are mostly used for waterproofing, and those are forever plastics and that stay in our bodies and environment forever. Uh, so I was questioning myself on the use of alternative materials for waterproofing. I started by growing some kombucha to make scoby leather. I have some samples here. Um, it's quite a lengthy process, so I started that right away um, at the beginning of the semester. And in the meantime, I was thinking about what I was going to make with this material. 
I decided to make a jacket because my grandmother made a jacket for my father when he was in university. I thought it would be an interesting, um, interesting to recreate the process. I inherited all of her sewing equipment and her machine. Um, so I thought it would be nice to bridge the gap between us um, and have the connection to my family history through this jacket. So while I was making it, I kind of moved away from the industry and the materiality of the project and more into the care of the act of sewing for somebody. In conversations, I learned that um, when my grandmother was making this jacket for my dad, she was dealing with grief uh, at the time. And so, sorry. Yeah, she was um, dealing with grief and was sewing to keep herself busy. Um, my dad's had this jacket for 40 years and he still uses it. Um, and he recognizes the, the um, as he mended it and he repaired it, it allowed him to connect and understand the work put into making such a quality garment. And that relationship was expanded to other garments that he owns. So many jackets that he has, he's kept all these years because he understands the value and quality of work, even if it's not made personally for you by somebody that you love. Um, so care became the center of my project. Um, how how this jacket is self-care for the maker, care for the people who will wear it, and also allows the receiver to create a relationship to their environment and the objects that they own. How I incorporated that in the jacket. Um, so the kombucha leather was too thin to be able to sew it. So I decided to use um, a wax canvas. It's treated, how I would have treated the um, leather would have been the same, like waxed to be uh, water resistant. So I thought it was a nice substitution and easier to work with. Um, sorry. Yeah, so then I have the um, eco dyed cotton in the softer parts to allow breathability and um, to be worn easier. And then I have this paneling made of waste and alternative materials. This is some of the bioplastics that I made. And finally, I added all of these tags, I have it on the back too, that I found in my grandmother's sewing kit. It says, custom made especially for you by Martha Wake. Uh, I thought it was interesting because um, they're mass produced or mass printed. I've seen them in other handmade garments with somebody else's name on it, which I thought was interesting because um, her act of making was so personal and a craft handmade. And then that's kind of the link to production and industry that I, I also found when I was researching um, outdoor fabrics. And I didn't have a clear vision for this jacket while making it. I think it all, everything kind of came together with my grandmother, my history um, and how I wanted it to come out. And one t key takeaway I have um, from my research and from making uh, is that companies will center themselves as innovators and leaders in sustainability but what they're doing is not creating community, it's creating brand awareness. It individualizes people and makes them consume individually. I think to foster care for the environment that comes from creating communities, sharing tools and knowledge and coming together outside of consumption. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Allison, and my project is called Vestigios de Coquillage, which stands for Remnants of Shells, and it's basically an exploratory array of natural materials leading to the creation of ceramic-like composites composed of shell waste. So this project is, is really near and dear to my heart because I was always fascinated by shells since I was a, sh a child growing up in a region uh, very near to the ocean. And my family also grew up by the ocean. So maybe that, that's how and why I was drawn to, to shells. And I decided I really wanted to create something with an emotional function in a way. And I wanted to work with a material that truly spoke to me. And so after thinking for quite some time, I thought about repurposing uh, shells because they contain so many properties that can be 
um, useful for for making biocomposites, for example, and uh, shells specifically, I was looking into it and it takes a long time for them to decompose, especially if they are in large piles. And so I started investigating how I can collect shells. And so I visited different restaurants and um, a lot of them told me that I could not collect the, the shells, even though they were waste. So um, I, I was able to get them finally after searching for someone that could provide them to me. And so I got uh, clam shells over here and mussel shells. And so these were my first prototypes. I grinded them by hand uh, with a mortar and pestle. And I mixed it with calcium alginate, which is a type of seaweed uh, in a powdered form and water. And I found that it was very brittle. Um, so I decided to mix it with a pulp. Um, so I used a textile pulp, which is made of 100% uh, cotton. So it's, fr it's from the waste of textiles. And so um, I decided to test that. And as you can see, it's less brittle than these, which is just the calcium alginate and water. So I hope to expand on this project because I want to evolve this project uh, throughout my PhD and I want to collect uh, the shells locally and hopefully I can also collect uh, local clay by uh, riverbeds and instead of just um, extracting, extracting clay and hopefully create some sort of biocomposite that can hopefully decarbonize interiors. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. Um, so, hi, my name is Junior. This is my project, Voltus 749BWE. Um, so this is a speculative machine that um, sort of takes the idea of our technology, our contemporary technologies being really seamless and clean and uh, sort of uh, the opposite of this, basically. Um, and uh, I'm using uh, the aesthetic of uh, the mechanical and uh, sort of an uh, industrial sort of aesthetic to sort of represent the processes that are often out of sight of our technologies. For example, when we use our phone, uh, when we use uh, like um, technologies that have that use artificial intelligence, these have like a lot of extractive practice uh, practices related to it. So whether it be like actual natural uh, extractivism or uh, data or uh, there's a lot of human labor like there's a lot of like levels of extractions that happen and those that happen out of sight so my goal is to use the aesthetic and the physicality of uh, industrial infrastructures to sort of represent that uh, uh, within our a simple act of just taking a picture and putting it online we don't really know the scope of like actually what's happening under the hood so yeah so the the actual um, machine um, does someone want to try it? Yeah. <laughs> so you can I step like here about, and then um, it's it's half working all, but the 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 thing is is still happening. But so you can press on the green button and look directly in the camera. So the goal is to take a picture, and the light sort of sends it like there, and then it's dropped. I'm using sort of a factory ish. Uh, I want to speak also about like our how our data is commodified and sold and transformed like a, a, a sort of man manufacturing processes and um, so yeah so uh, <laughs> this is sort of that uh, I want to like I obviously this is a, a first prototype and I really want to like make it uh, there's a, a big aspect like the sound aspect was really important to me but uh, I didn't have time to really put this forward 
but um <laughs> so yeah we're <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah that's it uh i'm gonna pass to audrey So hello everyone, I'm Audrey and my project is titled uh, Altertronics Redefining Sustainability in Electronics. And for this project, uh, I've explored various uh, alternatives to materials that are contained in your electronic devices and especially to um, critical minerals. So critical minerals, they are uh, minerals that we see in every electronic devices and batteries, such as copper, uh, lithium, cobalt, uh, also the rare earth elements, and much more also. And um, the thing with these is that they are very harmful to the environment. Um, they, they produce air pollution, they consume a lot of water, they pollute water also, they destroy the landscape, uh, the biodiversity and much more. And yeah, so it's very important to find alternatives to this. And also what's ironic behind that is that um, we use them here to make green technologies or so-called green technologies. But the thing is that the pollution that is uh, created is it's done just before when we extract the critical minerals and it's done far away from our eyes and ears. So, uh, for example, most of the critical minerals are extracted in developing countries. So we don't see it. We don't hear, hear about it, but it's there, the pollution, and we don't have to cope with the consequences of it. So it's kind of a uh, an irony, I find it, and an injustice also. So... That led me to think about other ways to make electronics. And it gave way to two things that I found out. So I made uh, an alternative battery. And also, I found alternative um, conductive materials. So for the battery, um, it's actually a saltwater battery. So it's composed of the 16 jars you can see here. And it's filled with salt water. And for the electrodes in each battery, in each cell, um, I used uh, old batteries that I recycled and I took the anode and the cathode from it. So uh, the cathode here is a graphite rod and the anode is a zinc plate. And what's also interesting is that it's rechargeable. So you just have to apply a reverse current to it and it will reverse the chemical reaction. So to recharge it, I just um, used this old crank uh, flashlight that I had in my closet and that wasn't useful at all because it wasn't working anymore. And in fact, it was the battery that we recharged once we turned the crank um, that was no longer working. And this is an issue we see with many electronic components is that it's not made to be repaired or to change uh, an aspect of it. It's just meant to be thrown away. And it was the case with that one. So what I did is, is I removed the battery, which was very hard because it was glued and soldered and not made to be removed. But anyway, I managed to do it. And then I just plugged in my salt water battery on it. And now I can recharge it when I turn the crank. I can show you. You, see, you will see the light probably um, uh, be lighting uh, more, more intensely. So the, the level of charge depends on how long you crank it. And yeah, so that's it for the saltwater battery. Um, as for the conductive bioplastic, so this is an alternative to standard copper or any conductive material we use. So I wanted to make a conductive bioplastic without using critical minerals. Um, so instead I used salt. Um, and the particularity of salt is that it's only conductive when it's uh, dissolved in water or in any liquid. So um, this means that my bioplastic always has to be humid. That's why I brought this, because <laughs> um, we, we need to take care of the bioplastic and each day water it uh, as if it's a plant. And that's also the reason why I added moss on top of the bioplastic, because um, it 
it has the same, uh, it requires the same care as the bioplastic. And also I feel like it, it develops an attachment to it when there's a living thing in it. And I don't know, I just uh, like the look of it. And also it makes me think of ground and you see the wires going in the ground and it recalls that, um, you know, the critical minerals comes from the ground, from an extractivist practice and that we have to uh, be responsible in how we, we consume them. And uh, lastly, a particularity of the bioplastic is that uh, according to how humid it is, it will be more or less conductive. So the more humid it is, the more conductive it is. <laughs> okay. And this means also that the light will um, be more bright when there is more water in it. So in this way, the bioplastic is a sort of uh, humidity sensor and the light is a sort of indicator of the humidity level. So that's it. Are you still taking the base now? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali. I'm studying in the joint major in computer science and computation arts. Um, a lot of my practice involves the digital realm. So that's kind of the route I took. Uh, the name of my project is Digital Consequences, Grasping the Physicality of Our Carbon Impact. Um, my project explores the invisible, uh, invisible digital footprint using a visual representation in order to translate the intangible and hidden environmental costs of our digitiz digitization into relatable forms in order to promote uh, digital consumption awareness. In the modern era, the innovative advancements of digital technology have become an integral part of our lives. There are significant environmental concerns regarding the energy consumption, greenhouse gas emission, emissions, and carbon footprints caused by people's dependencies. Various studies have estimated that the internet's greenhouse gas emissions are between around two to 4% of global carbon dioxide emissions, which shockingly enough is uh, equivalent or a little bit higher than the emissions from the aviation industry. So naturally we focus on the goods or service that we're given and we ignore all the processes uh, and high energy requirements involved in providing these experiences. Us as users, we mostly interact with the output and we aren't aware of the data transmission, the energy required for the data centers and the embodied energy and hardware creation. And um, I thought that closing this awareness gap will help us as users think about the full life cycle of our online interactions and promote a more sustainable way of consuming our digital content. So uh, the common perception of the internet has the term the cloud. And to me, like, it's a very ambiguous term and it kind of alludes to that something's up there and it's not really relevant or important. And it kind of obscures the environmental repercussions of our digital consumption. And it makes it much less understandable to grasp our actions. My goal was to turn the ambiguity into a relatable form by allowing us to physically feel the weight of our digital actions. So this hands-on experience transforms the abstract concepts into something relatable fostering awareness and encouraging mindful choices in the digital realm. By physically holding the weight of our digital actions, we can gain a deeper understanding of the environmental impacts of our consumptions and foster a sense of individual responsibility for our actions. So my approach to this project was a lot of research and a lot of looking into um, the carbon footprint of different things we do on our day-to-day -day lives. And for this specifically, I decided to hone in on three. So I focused on emails we send, uh, hours of streaming videos, and Google searches. So the math involved wasn't too tough, but the only issue is there's a lot of components that come in to calculating carbon emissions. It could depend on where you're located based on the data servers. And yeah, so it's all rough estimations, but it's still important to know because even if the numbers are slightly off, we need to know these things because our habits are truly affecting the 
climate crisis. So what I did was I used the conversion factor of grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is how our carbon emissions are weighed and converted that into pounds. And then for each thing, so for an email, one email uh, costs is four grams of carbon dioxide equivalent. So essentially I did the calculations for each weight. So once we are able to hold the weight, we actually get a sense of how many emails did I send in order to cause this much weight of carbon dioxide. So yeah, that's my project and I'll hand this over to Azmat. Okay, yes. Yeah, so pretty much uh, I'm a CART student, so we don't do as much design. So this was kind of a new experience for me. And I was struggling to think about what to focus on. And then eventually I settled on uh, the bins because uh, I saw a note that said, please don't put trash in recycling, which I thought was kind of funny because I guess people weren't really caring about where they were throwing things. And so then I started paying attention to what these bins are that are all over Concordia, what their purpose is, the materiality of them and things like that. So um, uh, the first thing what was the first thing I did. Sorry, let me check my notes. Yeah, so the first thing was just the themes because uh, I wanted to link it to this idea of caring. We all want to care about things, but when we throw something away, we just forget about it. So we're not really caring that much. Uh, we're just kind of hoping that zero waste, which is the people that handle these bins, we hope they take care of everything. So um, I started researching it, and uh, uh, Max Laboron Le Le was uh, one of the researchers that was uh, covering this I issue of discarding waste and things like that, and how waste bins are used. So um, I decided to do an expert interview with someone at Zero Waste, and that there was one of the representatives, and she kind of explained to me their whole design process and things like that. But she mentioned she didn't do surveys with students. So I thought that was kind of interesting because it's a design thing. Maybe some surveys would be uh, a good way to go about it. So these are just some of the pictures I took. There's so many different types. Uh, what I learned from the um, interview was that they try different styles. So they'll try one approach and see if it works. And then they'll actually go through each bin and look at how people are throwing things out. And um, some bins work better than others. Like this one here is for landfill. And um, the bin is, the top is a certain way. Uh, I'll explain uh, in a second. Uh, but what I decided to start doing was 3D modeling it. So I started um, uh, doing some scans and stuff of the bin tops. So if you look at these here, these are the tops uh, of those that I actually scanned at Digifab. And uh, I started playing around with them and uh, seeing what I could do. Um, and then after that, I did an interview with students. So I ended up doing the survey that uh, I thought was pretty useful. And uh, some of the students filled out this form and they uh, picked out what they liked and what they didn't like, what types of bins they liked. And then, um, I got a, a better idea on where people's heads was at. And uh, it turns out the emotion that was the strongest was actually neutral. So most people in the survey said they just felt neutral about it or confused because there's a, a lot to pay attention to. So uh, eventually I started doing uh, more photogrammetry. I thought that we needed to personalize sort of the experience a bit. So that is actually me in that 3D model contemplating how to throw something out. Um, and then I also started uh, playing around with some of these like stickers that they put on, if you look closely, they don't actually say what it says on these. So you guys can maybe take a look at that later. Um, what else? <laughs> uh, so yeah, the idea was imitation and exploration. So I was, the idea was just to see what I can uh, imitate and then like what, what comes out of it. Uh, ultimately what was revealed is this idea of greenwashing. So I don't know if uh, people are familiar with that term. Uh, it just means that, uh, a lot of the in, like uh, recycling, uh, I guess, uh, industry is based around container industries that actually want to like whitewash recycling and plastics and make it seem like it can be solved by just us throwing things out properly. When in reality, it's like more of an industrial problem and a, a supply chain issue based on the types of uh, plastics that are manufactured through these supply chains. Um, yeah, so about this top, uh, the reason that they designed it like this was um, they wanted people to have to kind of touch it a little bit, and that will make them more hesitant to use it. 
And in my interviews, a lot of students said they liked the bins the best, but they didn't have to touch, which I thought was kind of an interesting convergence of these two things. Uh, yeah, also, if you guys want to check out the interviews and stuff that I did there in these pamphlets, I think that's about it. Yeah, thanks. I think the sub, sub, no, it's uh, Julie. Hello everyone, my name is Julie and I am a computation art student. Today I'm presenting Leaf Chronicles, which is the exploratory narratives of leaves and plants as entities in um, in a in a and humans living co cohabiting in uh, in in kind of a single world in one ecosystem. So I used a lot of so I I did a lot of walk and I uh, took a bunch of photographs of of the leaves and the plants that I've been encountering along the way. So in the city, in the in the downtown, in the in the parks. So anything that catched my eyes and and eventually it became a bit obsessive because uh, leaves are so a complex uh, matter there what attracts me m most about them is their the, like the quality of aliveness like what makes them so fleshly um like living what makes them so animate compared to other static o objects um and materials so uh, yeah, and I've collected over thousands, thousand files, and I was really, you know, trying to figure out on how to format them and how to present. So I've decided to make uh, videos, and then the video of the of the photographs, uh, and uh, sort of a collage, interplaying and creating an open narrative, so everyone could could see and and see make a, their own interpretation and then the um for the video of uh for this screen i've used i made a um, mirror i've edited them in a mirror video which uh make the the movement <clears throat> of the well of the plants and leaves to stand out so uh, so what you see here uh, for example is a very organic and a real um, movement of of the leaves the the kind of the gesture by wind so I didn't really edit the the speed and this is how they appear and uh, yeah I, I really found that the fascinating when it was in symmetry that it's created a new ty type of uh, shapes. And then um, I've also, the next step was to project the um, my, my videos onto onto myself. Um, so, so here you see uh, me kind of performing with, uh, with the nature, with the, uh, yeah. And the, here I wanted to, um, really to ex to relieve the moment you know the the nature is so ephemeral like nothing is is similar each leaf each every single breath wind is so movement is so unique and the other thing um which i noticed was it's um in this experience um it was about um uh, merging what what i i saw in, in the world from outside myself and then everything became one so what I saw and me and uh yeah and then trying to you know building this fostering the connection with 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 nature and yeah the, the, the photographs I I made also I use digital uh, microscope microscopic camera to really get into tiny invisible details that we can can see with our eyes and it was so um yeah i didn't expect to see all this tiny little fleshly uh intricate details on them 
Um, what else? I've also, um, if you notice, I have some uncanny images in between, which are as AI uh, generated. Um, those are uh, the prompts were inspired by the uh, by my observations in nature, and initially I was curious to to imagine those uh, to use um, AI to imagine the what would happen if our clothes uh, or if our skins were was like plants, you know, the patterns, the shapes, and what would that create. Um, but yeah, you will you will see like in the yeah here for example what would happen if the movements and all merged into one and yeah that's uh that's pretty much it and I, I also have yes <laughs> I forgot um some experiments with bioplastics and uh, yeah we did this with a group and uh, the other day when I when I saw this after three weeks the bioplastic we put the leaf inside and some uh, yeah the, the green leaves and it made I, I found surprising uh, to find out that it created the the mold the the fungi over it and it was quite a, a surprising discovery because the leaf has the like this humid and lively texture while the bioplastic itself is is not is clean while it's yeah it made this interesting kind of pattern yeah, um, that's pretty much it. I pass the mic to Saba. Hello, my name is Saba and my background is in architectural technology. And uh, my project title is a super absorbent materials, a passive strategy inspired by nature for designing responsive shadings. Uh, as you know, the primary function of shadings is uh, to protect pedestrians and buildings from uh, severe weather conditions. Uh, however, since weather conditions are dynamic and changeable, users often uh, require adjustable shadings, either manually or mechanically. Therefore, I have been inspired by the responsive behaviors in nature natural organisms to propose a smart shading and uh, facet design concepts that are responsive to rain and sun in a passive way. Uh, responsiveness is a factor of sustainability that nature utilizes. In fact, nature not only ad uh, adapts itself to the environment during the evolutionary process, but also employs intelligent methods to interact and respond to changing factors in environment. Following this concept, I have explored uh, various responsive materials, particularly super absorbent materials, uh, which are, these materials can absorb uh, and retain extremely large amounts of uh, liquid relative to their own mass, uh, with some of them even being able to absorb up to 800 times their own weight. So uh, these materials come in different shapes and functions, including natural or synthetic in different shape of wood, powder, or solid. My focus for design was on the swelling and the shrinking factor feature of these materials in response to rain and sunlight. I have a prototype of a smart canopy that can open and close automatically in response to uh, exposure to water and humidity. Uh, the design includes a water tank for collecting rainwater and a cylinder that fills with uh, super absorbent materials. Um, as the materials expand in response to rain, the canopy will open. And uh, as it dehydrated in the response to sun, the canopy will be closed. You can find the time lapse of the, this process on the screen and also uh, the process in the nature that was inspiring for me. Thank you. Okay, so my project is about um, construction waste and material reuse. So I kind of have a preoccupation with garbage and thinking about why is it garbage? Um, could it be something else? 
how can it not be garbage? And to answer those questions, this project spo focuses specifically on the construction industry because it's a big contributor both to greenhouse gas emissions and the solid waste stream in this country. Um, because besides wood and steel, a lot of construction materials, if they're reused at all, they're downcycled. So to investigate this, I collected um, construction waste from construction sites around the city and kind of planned to work with whatever I found. And I ended up with uh, concrete chunks and asphalt chunks. And I ended up going back and collecting some dust later as well. Um, and to inform my material reuse, I looked into the physical, uh, historical, and geographic origins of the materials because I wanted to take a very material-centric approach to the project and really focus on listening and engaging with my materials instead of just using them. Um, so something uh, that informed my exploration that I learned during this investigation was that these materials are formed through a series of cyclical processes of collection, crushing, and reformation. So that kind of seemed like a viable approach I could take in um, my material exploration. And another important thing I learned is that um, con uh, concrete is inert, so it can't do any more chemical reactions once it's cured. Asphalt is not the same, but it still needs more additive or more binder added to it. So regardless, I would need something to hold these new materials together. And after having the biomaterials workshop in our class, I was inspired to explore this avenue to make these new material composites. So I did three different um, recipes, I guess, for experimentation. Um, this first one is made with Damar resin, which is a natural resin that comes from trees. And I was really focused on what kind of sensorial experiences um, each material could kind of create. So these ones are like kind of shiny and smooth, and they're also pretty strong. Um, some earlier prototypes were breakable with hands, but the later ones... Strong. <laughs> yeah, so those ones I feel like are pretty strong. And then these ones are a um, agar agar bioplastic. Um, and these ones use the concrete dust. Um, these ones are very interesting because they get deformed a lot when they dry. Um, they shrink and they have a kind of dusty texture, but because they take so long to dry, I thought that they could have some maybe sculptability or carvability, which you'll see in one of the videos and in this one here that I played around with while it was drying. And then the last recipe is a potato starch, which um, I made with kind of dust, uh, a mix of dust and then the aggregate I crushed myself before I collected the dust, which actually worked the best. Also takes a very long time to dry, but once it's dehydrated, it's pretty solid for the most part. Whereas the ones that are more dust are a lot more fragile. Um, so I would definitely want to explore further what kind of applications these could have in the built environment, but it was fun to play with some garbage and try and turn it into something that's not garbage. Thank you. Um, I think Junior is going to introduce. Junior is going to introduce our next activity. <laughs> Hi, I'm Junior. I'm introducing our next activity. Um, so we're going to take a short break uh, of about twenty minutes, and then you can just uh, go and see the projects on your own. And uh, we also have an activity where, if you still have your materials with you, um, we want to offer a plat like a. Um, a sort of way to commemorate your experience with your material. And uh, you'll learn also more about your materials during our table talks after that. Um, but so we have a photo booth that we're going to set up. And if you want to take a picture with your materials, that would be nice. Um, and um, so, yeah. And then after the break, there's going to be the table talks in 20 minutes. Thank you.
is the one I wait for. He is the one I'm looking for. No one. But does he know what's do? I'm twisted and fine. It's too late. I'm twisted and fine. Hey everyone, we have five minutes left of break. We'll be coming back in five minutes. Thank you.
everyone. We are back from break. If we could gather, I believe we're moving to the round table section of the day. Thanks, everyone. We're back from break. I know me too. I keep forgetting. All right. So welcome back from the break. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone. Thanks to uh, all students who presented their project today. Uh, uh, I see a lot of love and effort put in display in presentations. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So around the table, uh, Right now, we have Saba, we have Julie, we have Alison, we have Ali, and we have Audrey. So congrats on your project. So we, uh, we're going to discuss different, uh, different aspects of it, whether material, whether social, whether in terms of methods, in terms of potentials, applications. Uh, but before we start, uh, this, the group today asked us before, um, before the presentation to pick an object on the table and to keep it keep it for the rest of the afternoon. Who still has their object? Can you raise their, your hand? Great. You, you still do? Okay. I, I kind of had to abandon mine because it was a little piece of sponge and I held it so tight during the presentation that it kind of imprinted in my hand. So I was like, what hurts? Oh, okay, that sponge. Okay. <laughs> but I'm just curious, how did you engage with this object during the presentation? Did you, uh, did you forget it? Did you think about it? Uh, what, was your, uh, what was your interaction with this object? Anyone wants to jump in? Yeah. Okay. Where's the other microphone? Yeah. Wait. They'll give you one. Yeah. Uh, I got a piece of fabric and little tag from Megan's jacket, and I tied it in my hair. Just well, Megan regularly puts little bows in her hair. And so I feel like it's very fitting to incorporate the object yeah. in the style that she would. Anyone else wants to comment on their interaction with their object? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I get socially anxious. So I was using this like uh, like to relax. And actually, it bear with me all the way. So it's good. <laughs> it survived. Yeah. Good. Oh. Okay, great. Did you pick an object? No? <laughs> oh, you can't cheat like that. That's your presentation. Okay. <laughs> All right. So maybe to uh to uh, open the floor for a question, uh I would uh ask a first a general question. Okay. So you are um you have projects that are at the intersection of, I would say, um, solutions for the built environment, but also speculation, but also uh, awareness related. So what objects are related to each of your projects or what applications? Taba? Um, the object that was related to my project. Oh, you have to, sorry. <laughs> Hello? Okay, it's fine. Uh, the objects that uh, are related to my projects are uh, the sponge that you mentioned. It's uh, the lufa, a natural material that is also super absorbent and can um, absorb and retain uh, um, very uh, large amounts of water and also swell. Uh, and another one, are the water beads that I think the Kegley <laughs> chose them. Uh, there are the synthetic type of uh, super absorbent materials that uh, there are also high density that could uh, retain in their shape when they absorb a water. But can you uh, give us a little bit more insights about what creates the 
open and close uh, mechanism in, in the in this little umbrella that you created. Yes, uh, you know about the super absorbent material, the feature that was so interesting for me was the swelling and shrinking of them in the exposure to the humidity and water. Um, I, I have searched about it and then no one used this feature of the material for um, in architecture. And I think uh, this feature has a great potential uh, to uh, to be used in the uh, smart uh, facet or uh, also a smart canopies and shadings. Um, and in, in the course type that I have presented, um, the super absorbent material uh, used for opening and closing a canopy, uh, I have used it in a cylinder that could push up the uh, a cylinder to open the um, structure. Yeah. And I'm curious also, Saba, to uh, understand more like in your structure mechanically, because we know that it's a close-up that you showed us in, in video. What, where is the the material mechanically situated within the structure so it creates that movement? Can you just explain us a little bit more technically how it works? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the the system is completely closed and um just the um, in interaction between the environment and the system is the water. So uh, there is a container in the system that uh, it collects the water. And then uh, there is a, another container that super absorbent material. Um, we put uh, them in this and they uh, there, there is a mesh that they can um, absorb the water through that mesh and then swell. And uh, they, this swelling push up a cylinder to uh, mm. opening the umbrella or canopy. Thank you. Yeah. It's like a piston. Yeah, yeah, exactly Pushing like a piston, up. yes. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Julie, do you want to discuss a little bit about more uh, a little bit more about the uh, objects or application embedded in the in your project. Mm. So yeah, I've been exploring leaf as a living textile, and as I said earlier, I was so um, inspired and drawn to its liveliness, and it's one of the aspects of the well, the properties of the leaf that it's very changing. It's never the same. It's once exposed to the certain climate environment, it tends to adapt to it. Um, so, for example, in one of my walks, I noticed um, the I was just walking on the park and then uh, there was such a lushy, colorful, bright foliage of wine tree of wine leaves. And the sun was just like on on top of on top of it and on the other side the the building there was a building and there was a shadow like and the and then the leaves and they had less color like they they were so faded and and weak and i i, I just you know asked my myself why why is that why when leaf when it's exposed to light and sun it's kind of it has more you know vitality perhaps while on a shadow, it, it's less. But there is, of course, this the, the process, like this biological uh, pro process. But it's very, um, you know, it's never ending quest. It's never you never know what to expect from leaf. Or when we were experimenting with the with biomaterial with bioplastics, and when I found out that it had the the mold, the fung fungi grown from the moisture, it, it was also kind of a discovery. So that's, uh, yeah, the property that's, there's always something about the leaves that's, and we are also fundamentally connected to them, like the, the, the shapes of the, 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 the vines, the, you know, the structure, um, in a way, it's also like related to us as as humans, and we're fundamentally connected to to it. 
Thank you. Alison, you wanted this? Yeah. Yeah. So I, at first, I wasn't sure what material I wanted to work with because I was interested in different kinds of natural materials. But then I thought about our workshop with bioplastics and biocomposites. And I thought, oh, uh, maybe I could look into eggshells because they contain a lot of uh, calcium carbonate. And that's that has a lot of properties uh, for uh, different purposes. And I was thinking, oh, maybe I could look into other shells as well as well and understand how they interact as bioceramics and so i looked more into the approach and what other uh, designers and artists were working on and i started experimenting in the lab I was trying to figure out how to crush the shells, specifically the muscle shells and the clam shells, because they're much more, uh, they're much harder than eggshells. So I had to boil them. I had to cook them before actually crushing them because that process took a lot of time within itself. And so I, as I mentioned before, I used a mortar and pestle and that took like an hour for each of the shells that I was trying to create like some sort of powder with. And so I learned how to work with my hands a lot because it's a very hands-on practice and a lot of care went into it as well because I had to analyze how much, uh, what quantity of shells, what quantity of the calcium alginate, what quantity of water as well, and really looking into how the results came out to be was really interesting because I didn't think there would be so much uh, shrinkage and uh, absorption involved, especially using the different molds. I used uh, like a plaster mold, which absorbs a lot of water in comparison to the silicone mold that I used. But it was something that I want to look further into because I want to understand how I can help this um, this object or piece um, have a better result, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so the objects I put out were uh, one pound weights, and I actually thought it was interesting, and it kind of made me think, because no one picked them up. So <laughs> originally, I kind of thought about it in a way where one pound is not heavy, we can all carry it, it's pretty light, but for someone who would have to carry it throughout each presentation, eventually that one pound does get heavy. So how I kind of saw it was it, it applies the same thing to our digital actions. Because although, okay, sending one email, watching an episode of our show, they don't seem like big things. They actually do add up. And I did find it interesting that no one picked up my object because it kind of alludes to my project in the sense where no one wants to carry the weight and no one wants to carry the weight of their digital actions. So a lot of things are kind of like, I don't want to hold it. I don't want to deal with it, which is the same thing with what we do with our digital activities, you know? We are happy because we use our phones, we use our computers, whatever, but it's more of a, I don't want to know, so I don't have to feel that guilt and I don't have to feel that weight, which is what happened. No one wanted to feel the weight and no one picked my object. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Yeah, yeah, you want to say a few words? Yeah. Yes. So I picked uh, two parts of my process to get to the final result. Um, so the little container of uh, orange, crushed orange peels, and then the um, container of cabbage juice extract. Um, and I picked those because I really wanted my uh, project to focus on the experimentation and the process that it takes to get to the end result. Because what I find is that when I try to make a project sustainable, I always think about the final results instead of the process to get to that um and I tend to 
especially with oil paint, which is my project, I tend to overlook uh, what materials I'm using sometimes. Um, and it was just really interesting to delve deeper into a practice that for me isn't really looking at sustainability. Um, unless, unless you make a painting that is representing climate change or um, that is trying to um, reach more people, like, uh, I mean, promote awareness, the project itself isn't sustainable or, yeah. So the overall theme of my project was more exploration and um, the process that goes into the final result. Mm -hmm. So I can go on. Um, I brought two objects. One of them was the broken cell phone in the middle of the table. Um, and I brought this object because, um, well, I have a whole history with it. It was actually my first cell phone ever. Um, and I kept it up until uh, two years ago. It was an iPhone 5. So for those who know like the generations and everything, it was very old. And I was so sad when it broke. And it's like since five years, at least people told me that it was obsolete and I, that I could, I should change it. And then I had no choice. So I was kind of disappointed. And I think it, it uh, goes with the fact that we have to care with for our objects and we have to make sure they, they will last as long as they can. Um, and which was also kind of what I, I wanted to talk about with my project. So in that way, I think it's in a an, in an, uh, conversation. And I also brought another object, which I don't see on the table. So I guess someone has it. Um, it was a glass. Uh, that used to be one of my prototype for the cells. So I filled it with uh, salt water and just put two uh, pieces of aluminum foil in it, which was, uh, I used it as my electrodes. And over time, over many days, say even weeks, this, the water all uh, evaporated and the salt made a weird reaction. So it all crystallized all around the, the glass and in a sort of osmosis a reaction it also crystallized outside the glass and it was so beautiful like I like the shininess of it and I think it's a beautiful uh, thing that I found out just by mistake mm -hmm. and at first my idea was to use it as a light shader to put my my lights under it and it's so beautiful I tested it with my cell phone my light the light in the cell phone and it was so pretty however my LEDs I chose were not bright enough so we couldn't see him through the through the glass so mm -hmm. I had to uh, remove this idea but I, I kind of liked it so <laughs> maybe another day <laughs> thank you Audrey I don't need this one oh, yeah. let's keep it <laughs> Does the owner, do you have any follow-up question to uh, uh, this preliminary many. <laughs> as <laughs> <Okay>. usual <laughs> No, it's, it's well. First of all, congratulations to you all because it's fantastic what I what I see here, and uh, I'm really happy to see all these uh, different projects on on ideas that I'm myself working on. And um, so yeah, I have I have some questions, like for for Sarah, for example. I mean, I'm fascinated by the idea that you know the shell is a kind of a ha home for for an animal, right? For a snail or for a sea sea animal, and uh, could we think of reusing this material to make our own home, for example, and especially the shape? I mean, the shape, the you know, organic shape of the shell. Yeah. So I I wasn't thinking necessarily of using like just a shell, but um, I was thinking of using it as an application for uh, some sort of biosurface so more of like an interior finish because I've always been drawn to air and how we breathe and what we breathe and I think it's a very fascinating uh, material and I think that it it can definitely be mixed and applied with 
some sort of other material that can maybe absorb humidity and um, VOCs um, and all, all those things. So I'm definitely looking to further my research and evolve it with this material. So, yes. <clears throat> Wonderful. And uh, yeah, but your project is, I mean, I definitely felt guilty of lifting up because my carbon footprint is horrible for sure. Because I'm, I travel too much, and, uh, and uh, so I was wondering, I mean, how much weight would have your own research to make this? So, like, if you will materialize that, you know, cause... yeah, <laughs> it's definitely something I felt guilty about because one of my um, like like calculations that I was looking at was Google searches, and it takes a lot of research to get a lot of this information. And even as something so silly as searching for the amount of carbon footprint from a Google search, it's, yeah. It's absurd in a way. It's absurd, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, just throughout this whole process, getting to actually see all the things that I've done and so many uh, tedious things too, like, for example, one of them is uh, a pound in weight is equivalent to around eight hours of Netflix. There has been times where I fall asleep and my show plays and plays and I wake up and it's on. So just through me sleeping by accidentally leaving my show on, I cause things like this. So it just honestly just helps even me be conscious with things like that. Because I think it's something so easy. Just turn off my computer. And I wouldn't have those effects. So, what would you think in your in your practice to continue the, like this project to to create something that really gives us like hints on how we can we can save? Yeah. So I I did put a lot of thought into that, and a big part of it is people don't want to change unless they feel responsible themselves. But another part of that is like people sometimes just don't want to know because they don't want to know that they're causing these problems. So it's, it's hard to make people change because if I, I saw a bunch of websites and apps that can help track your uh, online activity and help you reduce that. But a lot of people just don't want to, <laughs> they don't want to see it. They don't want to be like, Oh, like I'm doing bad for the environment. I'm releasing these. They just want to continue with their daily habits. So it, it's, it's tough. That was, that was a really but big Can you thing. imagine this happening in, in, in your future practice that, at some point, you like you really say, I, "I'm gonna do a piece that really shows like what you can do." I ideally yes, okay. but yeah. with that, my problem is how you yeah, know. But that's... Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to see that though because I think it's really interesting and important, especially with all Please the advancements do. in technology. <laughs> I'll try for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm curious, Ali, because it's a it's a it's a good question actually because there is a a whole approach of digital sobriety, which is about you know creating websites that weigh less and that have less images and that are more I would say uh, that with a lower carbon footprint, and and this is re really interesting. But I'm 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 really curious if you if you looked into until how much what what's the limit people are are ready to compromise because we're used to rich experiences online with images with movement with sound with everything and then what happens when we're faced to those almost back to 1991 website i'm just i'm just curious did you read anything interesting about it or did you did you inquire about like what was the threshold was the limit of accessibility for people yeah um i'm not sure if there's a threshold but i know with certain things there are definitely like limits that they can pass i don't know exactly what they are but it, it did make me think in like an example of you was saying like uh, the quality of things and i took a 3d like digital production class and it was actually interesting because one of the tasks we had to do was lower the like poly of one of our designs and it just like i don't know it's just different ways of like it, it gives you the same product but with much less like power so i i have seen a lot of campaigns in order to reduce things so one when, when i was researching netflix they were working with i believe it was the carbon trust and their goal was to reduce overall emissions. 
So I don't know if there's necessarily a limit, but anything is bad. So realistically, like their goal is to lower it because whatever they're doing now is not good enough. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I'd be just curious, uh, among the public, who is self-aware of their digital consumption? Who thinks about their digital consumption as something potentially problematic for the environment? Well, you can all say, not me. <laughs> and it will come can from I, Ali's argument. Expose, uh... But I'm curious, like, uh, among, among the group. Yes, Megan. Um, I am, and I thought I would take all my stuff, like, offline and into external hard drives, like, to keep, to store all my projects and my photos. And I was buying an external hard drive and telling the guy at the store, and then he was like, well, that's just, like, then they mine these minerals, and that polluted also. And I was like, all right, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to keep my things. Then. Yeah. So. Interesting. I, yeah, I'm not any further in my process. <laughs> I, I don't know. What do you do? How do you cope with your uh, digital uh, consumption? I just feel ashamed, I think. Of my, no. <laughs> but ashamed uh, enough to do something about this it? This is class, not therapy. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I have hope, I think, because uh, I think I got a lot of servers are becoming like very self-sufficient uh -huh. and they're trying to use like reusable energy to to operate so i think that uh in our abyss we can change things but also i think on the other side how they operate can also really affect it uh -huh. but i also think that it's a really good trend to come back to more simpler design and more like because a lot of it is just like kind of superficial like we don't really and i actually think that good design can be very simple and like and it can even be more powerful than like those flashy animations and everything but i don't think uh i think that like for example emails like maybe uh like we can find a way to reduce it but still i think it's more viable than sending letters like or oh, i don't know maybe uh maybe this would need to be uh, researched but like there's this kind of also, I think, line of, oh, is it more efficient? Like, uh, is it less? Because we need to communicate. So what's the best way to do it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's this. Yeah, yeah I haven't done the, um, the study, but and maybe Ali knows, knows the stats yeah. <laughs> about the, what's the footprint of uh, the Canada Post truck versus, uh, <laughs> versus an email? Uh, yeah, I just want to add, if, uh, if someone is interested also by this subject, there's a... Um, uh, one of my friends, Aaron Lee, he spent one year offline in the context of his PhD, and he documented all his uh, year offline uh, and how he sort of went through uh, the whole university kind of year where he had to like take classes, but like he can't register online and he also can't ask for someone else to do the things for him online. So he's like documenting all of these sort of things that he had to do to make and actually make people work even more around him so that he could have access to the things that we all have access because of internet. Um, and it was really interesting to, to read that. And also just during the whole process, he, um, before he went offline, he asked for the address of, uh, the, the actual like address to send letters of, uh, different people who were interested in the project. And every month he was sending a letter like a written letter of his, where he was at and what was his challenges. And he also gave um, uh, some sort of a uh, defi, like uh, something to do uh, before doing something that you think you're going to do online. Like, like ask at least one person in your, around you if you have a question instead of like going to Google first, like uh, try to add, ask like one person around you for the information and just like the little things that make you sort of build like stronger bonds with the people around you instead of relying on those technologies. Super so. interesting. Thanks mm. for sharing. And I'm I'm curious, Elizabeth, how do you handle your digital sustainability? <laughs> Don't just oh well mine's really bad. I, I work <laughs> for the federal government and um we go through a lot of emails. Um so that's why I in some way found a personal way to tackle yeah. that like the the larger scope like what Ali's tackling is it's so big <laughs> so I found a way to somehow reduce it to my personal level and I I attempted a more whimsical approach to somehow mm -hmm. repurposing these things mm -hmm. yeah it's super interesting maybe we can come back to it 
during uh, the second roundtable in conversation with Ali in the public, <laughs> because I we have so many other questions. Does he have other questions for uh, for the students? Or... Um, well, not not really question, but I I was really impressed by Audrey's work, like on with the with the battery, because we are also working on on a similar process. Actually, Audrey helped us also with the crystal batteries. So, and um, I'm I'm really happy to to see that. And also the, the fact that you can really see directly the effect of your own action in collaboration with this material that you have created to do something that is you know useful or potentially in any way even more useful than that. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's also one way that we get, a, we get away from the digital action and go into much more like real action, physical action into the world that can be also useful for us. So we create, we spend more time creating some system that can help us and also using it and collaborating with the system to mm -hmm. make things better. So this could be a kind of a way to a little bit counterbalance. Yeah, so thank you. And um, personally, I have a question about um, the principles of locality and the local in your work, because it's either in possible or very possible at different degrees because when i think for an example uh saba you uh imagining an umbrella or a responsive material or super absorbent material within say uh, a very hot climate and a very sunny climate versus here right now and when it's minus 11 is completely different so you have to think in terms of local uh, and and Alison, like I keep thinking about about the shells, and I'm just like, okay, do we have that many shells here? Like, how do we work locally? And Ali, you face a you face a challenge, which is like, the internet is distributed. Where's the local? Is there any local? And um, and and Gabrielle, you, you spoke a little bit about foraging, and and you you have this your salt resource, which needs to be sourced somewhere. So I'm just I'd be interested in hearing you about. That that reflection on how how is it possible to be local, how you adapt, or how it's impossible. What are the barriers? What are the obstacles? The roadblocks, uh, and so on. Uh, anyone wants to start? No. So as for the salt, um, I thought about it for a long time because most of the salt we get is from far away. Um, but I thought that you know the. St. Laurent River, just if you go up Tadoussac, then it's salty. So it could be sourced locally with efforts. Well, relatively locally, let's say. Um, but definitely we're not there yet. So it's a process we have to think about for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I think of pigments, I think of one project I was looking at called the Wild pigment project um and the whole website is about sus sustainably and uh, ethically foraging so the uh, creator wrote a whole um document on how to take without taking too much mm -hmm. and to take um but without um causing harm to plants or to ecosystems um and for those not in position to be able to forage locally um, they ship out very small amount of pigments from um, local artists. So it's a whole network of sustainable local um, foraging for pigments. So I thought that was really interesting. And um, especially for artists that really want to think sustainably and locally, it's a really good resource. Mm -hmm. uh, are you envisioning... Uh, to source uh, different plants locally, say next spring, or because right now mm -hmm. we understand that it's quite complex. It's a seasonal problem, but do you envision to pursue the process uh, in next spring and, and to refine it and to work with more local plants? Or, yeah. yeah, I think it'd be really interesting. Um, the only thing is, is that I really want to focus on not um, like cutting down uh, plants or taking from living organisms mm -hmm. so i'd so yes for um but i wouldn't know where to go so i'd have to do a lot more research on yeah. into it mm -hmm. but i think it'd be really interesting in expanding from food scraps to um 
plants and uh, construction debris, for example. Yeah. And Ali, I'm, I'm I'm curious to hear you because we spoke about like how uh, people don't care or may not care or may care less. Uh, do you think like is there such thing as local internet? We have a problem of visibility with those infrastructure. We don't see them. So I'm curious if if promoting a better visibility of the internet and how could help like improve practices or make people yeah. aware of all that because you face a lack of locality right that's something in your work yeah uh yeah like i said before a lot of like the terms with everything are very ambiguous and up there but i definitely think visibility would help that because it makes people accountable for their actions but it it's kind of tough because if it's in a way that's making you feel guilt like i don't know People will feel responsible, but people don't want to be guilted into doing the right thing. So is it worth it to make people feel badly about themselves to make change? Maybe. Um, yeah. But that's that's an interesting question that you bounce back. And I think uh, we'll leverage that question with Asmat in a, in a few minutes. So you can dig I'll further. I'll re-ask you after. <laughs> yeah, we'll ask you after. Think about it, Asmat. <laughs> We we snowball the responsibility of that question on you. Yeah. Well, I guess like it also like kind of not that I'm the asking. Um, when we uh went over with your emails, if, yeah. do you mind me exposing you to everyone with your email account? I thought, repeat the repeat the question. Um. Oh yeah, you can expose me. How many? Yeah. How many unread emails? I think it was eleven thousand unread emails. Unread. Yeah. Now eleven. 800 800 emails so I, i didn't do the proper calculations but i kind of <laughs> gave a rust estimate that's like around 100 pounds okay so when you hear something like that you you feel like oh crap like i can't believe that's oh, that's a lot yeah, but, but that, yeah does it make you be like i want to change that or you're like okay i heard it i accept it but i i'd like to develop an application That blocks every email. <laughs> <So serious. laughs> no, but I'm thinking how fantastic it could be to have a phone that weighs 11 pounds, actually. <laughs> Now, is it possible? Like, so you really get the feel of like, okay, I have to lift my phone and answer that. Then, but then if they are unanswered, they're not right. So you don't... Doesn't matter. Doesn't they're, matter. they're sitting okay. there being wasted and causing that space. Even your spam emails take up... Uh, Wow. much less but they still do but think about how many emails just sit there and cause this but waste but what if you read them then it's kind of double the weight or i don't know uh, i don't know i think it's it's it's, it's still stored and it and it travels yeah so it read and read doesn't matter i, I don't yeah. think so i don't think yeah. it so if you reply it matters Yes, so that's yeah, okay. that's, 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 now. that's the trick. Don't yeah. reply. Yeah. <laughs> Go green. Don't reply. <laughs> Go green. No one talk to me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm in a thing. Thanks, Ali. We'll we'll come back. Uh, we'll delve into those issues yeah. more with with the other group as well. And I'm curious, Alison, how do you deal with questions of locality? Because like do we have mussels here do we have what kind of uh shells do we have like i know that there's a zebra mussel that's an invasive species that's problematic travels between the great lakes and, and the saint lawrence river how what are your uh i would say your uh, ideas for working locally no yeah um so the shells that i worked with they were not local they were from restaurants which they get that from other parts of the world and that's something that i i accepted that i was going to do for this project but for future i definitely want to look more into the zebra mussels for example um as uh, in relation to the shells because un understanding invasive species is something that i'm also interested in, in looking into and exploring because I would like to do more site visits and ex exploration uh, through my work. And um, another material that I'm looking into looking looking into is local clay and visiting uh, riverbeds that have that clay and learn how to 
not just extract a ton of a ton of this material but in small portions and learn how to care about the material and care about the process of using it so yeah and Julia I'm curious because you worked with local leaves but you also worked with uh, artificial intelligence which is highly delocalized delocalized yeah how do you deal with uh, this tension yeah that's that's an interesting question because um yeah locally I would say I had up until now I had abundant of leaf resources around me mm -hmm. in the city anywhere I could just find them grab them <laughs> and and now we don't we don't really have much they're all dry they're decomposed on the ground and uh, yeah we can find we can either go online to search for types of leaves we're interested in, or now in the emerging topic is AI and you know the topic that I was interested in initially was imagining the the garments it was a very speculative thing like imagining our garments that merge into the skin in a way leaves do like it's it's a it's a bit abstract but if you if you think about leaves they they are the textiles on their own they're like materials they they don't need garments and i would just think what if you know we as humans would um would have garments like that why we really need to wear garments so there was a very a way a way to imagine using ai what images that might produce and the result was let's say um I want a garment morphing uh, in the form of a leaf or a human body with um, embedded leaf on the skin. So, and I and I would get all sorts of responses. It would either give me a literal garment from from made of leaves, or it would uh, make some abstract, like more like a leaves growing in a more like morphing into garments. And I found that approach more interesting, mm -hmm. uh, something that's a bit imaginative rather than literal. So, yeah. Yeah, but the, you know, the AI is still synthetic. Like it still visually feels synthetic and it's not really, well, we can't really touch what's on the screen while the leaves, they're still here the touchable mm -hmm. interesting the question of aptic versus uh, aptic. Yeah. virtual maybe it yeah. actually occurred to me right yeah. now yeah and and Saba just uh, to conclude on that question how do you work with the question of local climates and local environments uh, in your work do you envision those those collapsible and responsive structure being installed here in the Nordic climate or somewhere else? And what are the challenges and the... Yeah. Um, as you know, I'm a newcomer here and I'm coming from a, a location that has completely different weather conditions. And in my experience as a bio-inspired designer, we uh, usually pay much attention to sun and sunlight as a source of energy for our designs. So I have started my uh, research uh, on um, responsive materials and I was thinking about uh, responsiveness to the sunlight, but after a while I was taught that how should I even test my prototype in this weather? because here we don't have much sunlight or sun heat. So I have redirected my uh, research to super absorbent materials uh, because I, I see more potential um, about that to be responsible to water and rain. But it also um, needs so much research because I'm not familiar with the weather. So for example, I, I didn't uh, talk about the freezing temperature and how uh, this um, uh, 
this um, structure would work in, in the freezing temperature? That Does it work or not? And what happens to it? So uh, I think in the bio-inspired design, the environment conditions and weather conditions are so important. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was affecting my project so much too, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that uh, after that, well, I'll open the, the mic to the public if to see if they, they have questions. Just one last question. We touched base on, on those ideas yesterday with the first group about what is failure, what is process, uh, what are frictions. So I'm curious to hear you, like what surprised you in, in, in your process? What, what, were, what were the serendipitous moments and the less, the less happy moments? What happened that kind of shifted or modulated your project so anyone wants to jump in i want to start yeah uh yeah uh, you know about my prototype for example this is my fifth prototype mm -hmm. i i done um for other that they doesn't work perfectly <laughs> so i i know a lot about how failure could make me a disappointment in our project um but um i i think if we believe on the process and the scientific um, things that we are researching and we could find a way to um, make the projects works um yes and uh, also the thing that i want to mention about uh, my progress in this project that uh, I was so into use the natural materials for my prototype, but I, I found out that uh, in in this uh, progress, we need to um, focus on different aspects of the of different features of the material. So, for example, um, I, I didn't um, pay attention and when um, um, you know, natural material is um, hydrated, it might be a sticky mm -hmm. or it, it might um, uh, stuck in, in, the, in a cylinder or a stick to another piece of uh, another component of the structure. So um, I, after a while, I realized that I, I couldn't just use um, for this prototype, I couldn't use them. But uh, for example, for another uh, concepts that I have for my project that was about a smart facets, they could work for that one. So it, it was an uh, exploration that I, I just can uh, find out about it when I experiment mm -hmm. about it, yeah. yeah. Super interesting. And, and Julie, uh, what were the happy aha moments or the moments of despair or what happened like what changed in, in in terms of process from point a to point b uh yeah so i'm i'm used to i'm used to work with digitally a lot so i'm in computation art so we do a lot of things with computers and i took the this class critical materiality as an opportunity to explore more natural things more on a tactile way, but at the same time using uh, the skills, the digital tools that I have at hand. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting is that um, the, the technology that we sometimes used to think as something, you know, in an antagonistic way, like we think it's so bad for nature, for the environment, it, it could be the other way like it could be let's say i i, I use technology like cameras uh, my um editing tools you know everything i present was mostly digitally done even yeah, yeah the ai uh, the performance the projector uh, that somehow helped to like bring to better engage with the material, with the natural world, with the ecology, and it brought up, unveiled the things that were like hidden from from our eyes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a uh, yeah, that's a that, that the thought process process that I that I have, and also 
um, there was it was two sided just because I was looking at a lot of leaves at a lot of things to observe and in the end I felt like I had to take the picture and I had so many files and it was so overwhelming and I had to do something with it and I had to you know sort out hand hand by like by hand uh, but I also find this this process is very uh, educative or very insightful as I want to relieve, re-experience the, the moments. Um, like when I, in, in nature, I touch it, I really experience. But at home, when I watch, re-watch videos, I, um, I kind of see what I haven't saw before. And that somehow, yeah, even enhanced my comprehension and understanding, gave more insight into my research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I kind of found this practice a bit like therapeutic in a way, because I felt like as it's the word of the day. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest about that, because I I feel like when I work and play with certain materials, I feel more at ease. And I feel like I, with, with, with the mistakes that I ran into and all the trial and error I, I was going through, I, I, I learned that I need to accept my mistakes and learn from them and hopefully gain more knowledge from them and understand how we can grow from that yeah thank you um i think one of the things that i read that shocked me the most was that the emissions from our digital activities are either equivalent or higher than from the aviation industry so if it makes you feel any better all your traveling is actually better than what you're doing on your phone <laughs> um yeah, so just stats like that, where it's like, it really does make you think because although it's still only two or 4%, it's still crazy that it's higher than the whole aviation industry. And even stats that have been comparing it to cars. So one of the stats I found was that um, the amount of Google searches per year in weight is equivalent to a thousand cars. Mm -hmm. So again just more visualizing things and actually like being able to be like wow i am doing wrong uh, and just taking accountability and be like i should do things to fix it because i have a lot of capabilities too and i just have to actually put that into action mm -hmm. um i think my whole process was a bit frustrating because i kept um falling into more and more issues um and I know it was about, I really wanted to make my project about experimentation, but um, I didn't get the result I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I had to re-brainstorm, talk to other people, try to come up with new binders to experiment with. Um, because I knew the, um, the I essentially created dye baths. And I knew that those were the correct base. I just needed to find the right binder but I really wanted to go the natural route. So it was very difficult to find something that worked. Um, and my final like breakthrough, which wasn't exactly what I wanted still, but was uh, getting inspired by a natural wall paint. Um, so it's boiling flour with water and then mixing pigment into it. So I took that recipe and redid it my way. Um, but it's still not perfect. So it was just a really frustrating process, but I learned a lot about the um, experience itself. So, yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, so for my project, I feel like I've traveled a long way because at first my idea was to make a circuit uh, out of things that I could only find in my backyard. So I imagine using, for example, vines, instead of copper wires and using, I don't know, a flower as a sensor. And so I had like big ideas and all those assumptions ended up not being true. So 
uh, for example, plants don't conduct electricity. In my mind, as long as it's filled with water or liquid, it would work, but it doesn't. So yeah, I had to change my project along the way, but I still kept the idea of having more sustainable electronics. Um, and also when I made my first uh, prototype for the saltwater battery, it worked so well. Like I was very happy. I just took a glass, added water, added salt, didn't even measure the salt, put uh, pieces of aluminum foil for my boat electrodes and it worked very well. And I was so surprised. I'm like, is it that easy to produce electricity? <laughs> so yeah, I was very enthusiastic. And then when I tried it again, like a week later, nothing worked. I, I had my polarities shifting. It didn't know which one the, was the anode, which one was the cathode. So I still don't know why it worked the first time <laughs> I did it. But then um, I read so many paper and try and trying to okay. understand why this uh, behavior happened, and I ended up finding the answer in actually a forum, <laughs> and it was actually the galvanic potential, which is important because you have to have two different materials for the electrodes, uh, one that will uh, attract the ions and the other repulse it. So yeah, I understood that along the way, which is a good thing. And then I tested with uh, pennies instead of aluminum foil uh, for my cathode, if I recall well. Um, but just finding pennies was very hard because as you may know, here in Canada, we don't have pennies anymore. So I went uh, to through my friends and then my grandmothers ended up giving me 14 pennies, which was enough for what I needed. <laughs> um, and then I made my tests again, everything worked well. And I noticed that some of my pennies were a little bit dirty because they were old. So I decided to brush them with something very abrasive. And I noticed that I brushed them too much. So then I could see the zinc because it's just copper plated, the pennies. And then I began having so many troubles. It did, again, the polarities shifted and I didn't know what to do. So I decided instead of using batteries <laughs> that I open, old batteries that I open and I just reuse the cathodes and anodes. And then up until yesterday, it worked fine. But yesterday, I still had another issues uh, with my polarities keeping <laughs> shifting again. And then I, I thought that the only thing I did different, it was to use a straw to fill uh, my batteries with salt water. And the straw was in metal. So I think that the straw acted as the anode and then the cathode. Mm -hmm. I think that's what happened. I I mean, I can't say for sure. I'd need to make more experiment, but I just uh, charged my whole battery and uh, emptied the liquid and then filled it again without the metal straw and it worked. So I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a that's a happy ending. Yes. <laughs> but uh, just before we uh, we change participants, I'm curious: do anyone has a question in the in the audience for this group? No. Okay. So basically, I, I, congratulations again for uh, for your project. Uh, it's interesting to see how the, the the question of heuristics, iteration, problem solving, uh, technical problems failures is, is present, but also as a very productive and generative principle. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting to, to, to hear you uh, speaking about that process of, okay, it's not easy working with materials, but you, you learn so much along the way that all those discoveries stick and adapt to, to other contexts. So I'd like to congratulate you again for uh, this beautiful conversation, those amazing projects. Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> So we'll take a three minutes uh, break so we can uh, teleport the new participants around the table. <laughs>
Really? I feel like on my Sivan is like. No, no, that's just not. That's true. No uh, dark spots. No Sivan. Just perfect. I feel like you threw your event today. So it's like, present it like this. Just new, new to present it like this. On to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of important things to say. Yes, you have. Why are we here again? What? I said, why are we here again? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They I'm on. <laughs> All right, let's regroup uh, around the table. Uh, we'll start the second round of conversation with Tez, Ted, Junior, Elizabeth, Asmat, and uh, Megan. <clears throat> first of all, congratulations on your project. Uh, they're absolutely, well, first stunning, but also critically engaging, um, interactive. I'm really curious to hear more about them. Um, before uh, before we start, I'd like to open up uh, the, the the mic or the floor or the table to Tess. Do you have questions for for this group before uh, I jump in? Because I have many questions. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure I have questions. And uh, well, first of all, again, congratulations for for the beautiful work you do. It's amazing for me also to come and see all these diverse things and I connect to most of them because I, I practice also hybrid arts. Okay. So um, very good, very great. I have a question about uh, your material, for example. It's um I, I also touched it, I, I checked it and so the the soft one was more like so how how did you get that one? So I think the soft one you're referring to like the big square one that had yeah. like the circle. Yes. So that one is a, is an agar agar bioplastic recipe. And the only reason it's soft is because it's not fully dried yet. Oh. So once it's dried, it will be hard. Like the other ones that I, were like that brown. Okay. So that's but, in the process. Of, yeah. Oh. It's been like over a week, but it's still not dry just because it's thick and quite large. And that's actually nice to see the process like hmm. live so you understand. Yeah. yeah, it's like manipulatable still in that state before it gets fully dry. And your work made me think of, um, you know, I'm, I'm Italian. I live in the Netherlands, but I'm, I was born in Italy and I lived in Rome. And uh, um, do you know about the Roman concrete? That, you know, the ancient Romans, they used this mix mm -hmm. of um, materials to create this concrete. That is really strong, and in fact, after over two thousand years, we have like really huge buildings like the Pantheon or other that are made with this concrete. There, and probably they would stay two thousand more years there, if not more. It's amazing how this ancient material is still resist. And I was wondering, you know, can can we look into more like ancient uh, ways of making things and ancient technologies and things like that to, uh -huh. you know, to yeah, to get to get better in what we do. Mm -hmm. Is that a question for actually that's a question for everyone because I think everyone was uh dealing with you know uh, natural materials and you know understanding how to to make it also more ecological, you know, less polluting. And so po possibly ancient cultures were using this material and they were much more ecological, you know, than that. So Just because uh, you mentioned the concrete, when I was investigating sort of waste, modern waste, there's a lot of waste that lasts for uh, you know centuries or whatever that we're producing now, but it's stuff that we don't want. So it's yeah. almost our perception of it uh, changes how we view it because we view the concrete as like this beautiful relic, whereas we view our waste that we produce now as stuff we just want to tuck away somewhere. And uh, one of the researchers that I was investigating mentioned that that is kind of what has to change is we have to start thinking about this waste plastic because it's not going to go away. So we right. have to start thinking about it in the same way as like things that are going to last and how are we going to 
for the region. Maybe the difference is how do they pollute the environment? Because I know, for example, this type of concrete is not like the modern concrete that, that is polluted inside. So this one is not. So there are qualities maybe also mm -hmm. that we have to look at. But I, I totally agree, like because many people are also recycling plastic now to make new things, to make even bricks for construction, for example. There's a project called Precious, Precious Plastics. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But, but I think they're here at Concordia Precious Plastics. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, that was a project started in the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. But, but they're, 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 they're now they have yeah, an exactly antenna. Right. Okay, yeah, okay. But the fact I was struck by the, the, the idea that you recycle the plastic and then you make bricks to make houses, like old construction. No, do I really want to do that? Do I really want to live in a house with recycled, you know, plastic that makes big? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know actually, but I'm not that sure. So the so that the response to this idea that we do produce things that can last forever, maybe or very long time, but how do they? How do we do we really want that? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's no, but an that, open question. But that's know. a super interesting question because it touched based on what Asmat was mentioning about. You have the, the 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 noble materials and the unloved materials, and then this is also the kind of, of course, I don't know all the the elf studies about say the effect of having a house built of plastic and dirty, but it's also a psychological and emo, em, emotional one to say, okay, I don't want to live in a house made of plastic. If it was a hundred percent healthy for like as a human, and maybe we we would have to get used to it and just adopt plastic as a form of new geology that that forms in the Pacific anyway. So I'm just I'm just really curious what's the the boundary in terms of emotions, affect with materials versus efficiency. So that's a super interesting question that you ask actually. Also the terms and the uh, like purpose that it serves. So uh, the researcher uh, Libaro mentioned that she was um, on the ocean with a bunch of other researchers and they were discussing these topics and they came across like a buoy, a plastic buoy. And it had an ecosystem and plant, plant life and all this stuff growing on it. Mm -hmm. And then they had a big debate. Should we remove this thing or should we <laughs> keep it? And mm -hmm. Liberal said, no, just keep it. Cause it's like, it's, you know, from an external point of view outside of the humans, mm -hmm. it's serving the purpose, but it's plastic, it's waste, it's stuff we don't want. So ultimately the researchers decided to take it out, but then all the fish and all the, uh, you know, plant life and all the stuff that was living with it, it, they lost sort of this house, I guess, this home that they were using. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and it, it, I find it interesting that that question <clears throat> about materials because you know you mentioned plastic, but do you remember the um, the earth ships in the in the sixties as as habitats made of uh, fires and and bottles uh, and so on and of cycle materials? Still, still, still. Yeah, they're still there. Yeah, yeah that's it. But uh, this brings me to a question, perhaps about the longevity that follows up the test question. And this applies to to all of you in a way. <clears throat> How do you live with that question of either ephemerality or longevity in your project? You work with the digital. It's not exactly the same thing, but you both worked in a way that makes the digital tangible and physical. And that was an idea of like in your in your work and in in your group configuration also to look at those invisible processes of power. You looked at longevity, but from a social, familial, uh, family-oriented perspective. So I'm just curious to hear you more about this idea. Should we try to make things that last longer, or should we adopt ephemerality as a process of renewal? Open questions. Yeah. Um, for me, I, I actually really reconnected with my practice like my material practice because I come from a background yes I right now I've been in the past years I've worked mainly digitally but actually I started as a painter and I did glass work and I did sculptural work too so I reckon I really use this opportunity opportunity to actually reconnect with the material part of my practice and it felt so right and like so like I felt so good working with actual materials and it made me remember how much it was it it's it's such a strong medium to just uh, to make an experience that usually when we we think about like a media art interaction interaction pieces there's some there's this idea of ephemer ephemerality where it's 
I feel like it's not sticking as much as when you interact with actual physical materials. But so I think blending the two for me was just this idea of making the experience even more tangible in a in and make people reflect even more through their uh, through their use of uh, through through media practices actually. So so yeah, it was yeah I think adding a material like tacit uh, tangible material makes it make makes you i think think more with your hands and i think makes the idea of longevity uh, more accurate but, yeah. interesting it's an open question for everyone um i think that it's good to have a mix of long longevity and ephemerality which is something um i tried to work on in my project like using things as long as you can but then trying to find a new use for them and like reuse is something a lot of us dealt with but I was thinking in the past week or so like if I could reuse even the, the prototypes that I made for this project and I know some of them I could because I could just melt them down again um, and some of them I couldn't I don't think because similar to how concrete is inert after it's cured one of them go goes through like a dehydrating process that I'm not sure if I could reverse but it could be like um, turned back into aggregate again and then used in some sort of new mixture so I think having that durability of things but also having them be um, capable of being reused is a good balance to strike Mm -hmm. uh, with my project I was uh, thinking of longevity I think of the virtual waste I interact with every day in my practice and even if I were to like properly dispose of it it's still not disposed just because it lives wherever it lives in the digital world like when you dispose of things on your computer it's just only tombstoned it's it still exists so finding a, a way to give it new value in a way makes that longevity more tangible. And even then with my project, I can just keep expanding on it if I wanted to. I only created 15 pieces. I would have liked to create more like 30, 45 and make it like a really nice thick book. Um, but in that way, it, it can live forever. <laughs> Like um, for me, I haven't thought yet of what the future, the life of my object will be, mm -hmm. or but thinking in the context of fashion, um, the models that we have now for disposability of garments is in like fast fashion, isn't optimal, and so I think I was thinking about increasing longevity or like how yeah, increasing the length of a garment serving you um especially in outerwear because i know having worked in the ski industry i know you get a kit and you wear it for one season and then you want a new kit uh -huh. um so yeah i was kind of creating that personal connection to something that can stay with you longer yeah because i mean it's not only material longevity but in in in, in your project especially it's it's the emotional longevity of a a family link that is pursued so this is quite interesting and and i'm i'm curious uh as matt how do you deal with that question of ephemerality or longevity in your project like either in terms of the materials you use or the subject matter you research because like you know that waste doesn't go away it just goes somewhere else so what's your take on the question <clears throat> um i think it's a framing issue like how we view waste so um we want it to not exist, but at the same time, we want it to exist. So, uh, mm -hmm. because something becomes waste based on your perception of it. So if you have a toy and you break it, it's waste, but if it, you don't break it, it it's not waste. So um, I don't know if there's an answer to that question. Uh, it's When I spoke to the expert, she just told me, you know, waste doesn't go away. It's just how we can try to learn to live with it mm -hmm. and try to frame our perception of it in a way that's constructive, but um, the solution, if there is a solution to waste not disappearing, it would have to be at the industrial level because we can't, uh, 
when I, they showed the number, it was, it was 97% of waste it was industrial. 3% was municipal, which means the stuff we deal with when we're throwing mm -hmm. things out. So that would have to change. And that would have to involve things like biodegradable materials and things like that. Um, it's a big, huge change to the way we run our society. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's an answer to the question, but there's ways to start to move forward, I guess. That's why I did the surveys. I mean, that's a beginning because they weren't doing surveys with the students. I thought that, would, that at least would get the ball rolling to start to answer some of the questions. And and speaking of the surveys, because I was fascinated in your uh, in your project to see all the different shapes of tops, and I kind of understood why I was always confused. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> because sometimes you can fit, sometimes it's it's a little sl slid, sometimes it's a round, sometimes it's a triangle, and then you try to fit this in the and the slit doesn't work. It's like, okay, so where where does it go and why? Knowing that there is experimentation around that fascinated me actually. But do you think it's um do you, do you, do you know what is the most optimal system? Should it be an open bin? Should, should it be um yes, yeah, so <laughs> that is the thing that they're trying to do at zero waste. So if you looked at the slideshow, there's a different yeah. style for a bunch of bins. Yeah. So when I asked them, you know, what's the design idea behind that? They said, one, it's the Concordia's design aesthetics that they have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. So it's the institution that says it can't look like this, but it can look like this. Okay. And then uh, the other part of it is trying to, um, the waste audits. So what they'll do is they'll, like once a year or something like that, they'll empty out each bin, but look how people are throwing things out and see if they're throwing it out in the correct bins. Mm -hmm. And they said that the ones that I picked actually are the worst performing ones. Because, oh, yeah. Yeah, because they can be moved around and the bin tops can be taken off and, you know, people can get confused. So they said the best ones are the ones that are integrated into the infrastructure. So it's something that's in the wall or something that doesn't move. And, uh, mm -hmm. but they're also, like I said, testing with uh, trying to get people that are averse to touching the lids, using those lids for certain types of, of uh, containers. But I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, it sounded to me like they're still studying it. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to explore there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, this, this is fascinating in, um, uh, in terms of, of the shape of, of, that you decided to explore, to build yeah. a kind of maquette or narrative into that wasting process or engaging with waste process. How do you think it can change habits or raise awareness? Well, the way I had made the maquette was to make one of the holes really big and one really small. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping people would notice that, but I don't think people notice the difference in the hole. So that was to highlight this difference in the experience because I'm really gigantic compared to the uh, mm -hmm. like industrial uh, uh, factory that I have on there. And that was to sort of show this idea that, you know, we have all this pressure on us, the individual, but the pressure should be on the industry. And, but we're turned away from it. We're looking at this small hole Whereas right behind us is this giant you know, mm -hmm. thing that needs to be emphasized in order to start getting kind of the outcomes that we want. Mm -hmm. waste. Yeah. And, but you, you touched an important point uh, when you said we look at the, the, the individual, but we should look at the industry. And it's, and it's an open question that I'd like to ask to, uh, to everyone. <laughs> and is uh, th that question of like, okay, is it possible to scale up your practice or is it necessary at all or not? Uh, I'm thinking in a way that like, what are the possibility, the potentials and the roadblocks of scaling up such materials? And, and in terms of junior, I mean, it's, uh, it's more digital, but there, this question of scale is still there because you expose huge systems, but at a smaller scale. So you do the kind of inverse process of distillation of an issue instead of trying to scale up and, and same thing same thing for you elizabeth and i see you more uh like align with that uh, megan in the sense that what are the roadblocks to scaling up those sustainable processes is it feasible or scaling down depending on which direction you go so can you speak about the potentials and roadblocks of this Yeah, um, I think it would be interesting to see what it would be like to scale up. And I think that um, the potential is definitely there. Um, I'm thinking of the Damar resin composite because that was my favorite one. But this is the glossy one. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that one, I really just had to heat 
the the resin because it came in a solid form and then mix the dust into it which i think could is a method that could be transferred to like a industrial scale pretty easily but that also for me brings up like ethical concerns because one of the reasons that i enjoyed this project was because i was like so close to the materials and working with them and i knew that um what i was doing was not very harmful because i was just like working at a small scale in my house so i wasn't in that like industrial um factory like mm -hmm. using a giant like vat to melt the resin and like letting off um emissions so it is something that I could see being scaled up, but I'm not sure if I would want it to be. I kind of like the slow, small scale okay. of production. Interesting. Yep. Uh, yeah, for me, I think it's, I'm thinking more of like bringing the experience outside of like academia and outside of ga like gallery space. I'm not really necessarily trying to change things in a more like a, in in a way where it's like I'm not trying to fight like these big companies I'm more trying to sort of make people through like a playfulness and a humor to try to make people uh, engage with the fact that they're not really understanding the technologies that they're interacting with and also maybe like urge designers to also take that into consideration because mm -hmm. sometimes I feel like we don't really think about that when we're using those uh, those intelligent systems so i think for me my, right now uh, a way to do that would be to maybe have a, i'm thinking of making something more public and more uh, testing it so that it's more understandable for the greater public and not necessarily for people who are really aware of those issues uh -huh. um, so that's a way that i'm thinking of scaling is just presenting that in a more accessible space and making it more uh, yeah public i think by using playfulness and using humor in a public uh, space to really grab the attention of people and to make them uh, interact with uh, with something uh, even if they're not really thinking about it um, about what's happening I think that there's something happening uh, in their head and they're they're gonna think about it at one point yeah. uh, it's not necessarily like fight like uh, I don't want to make people feel too bad about like the technologies they're using. I just want them to realize that they're more complicated than they, than they think. Mm -hmm. Mine's uh, similar to Junior's. I'm not particularly interested in tackling uh, big issues. <laughs> it's way too daunting. I don't have time for that. Um, most people don't, <laughs> um, but I'm sure someone out there is willing to, and I applaud that person. Uh, but I really wanted to scale down my issue at a very, very personal level. I'm tackling my own personal waste and my own habits. Uh, but similarly to Junior, um, hopefully with me tackling my own, my own <laughs> waste issues, hopefully other people can see how they produce virtual waste and hopefully try to find new habits. Uh -huh. Yeah, because uh, during your presentation, you were talking about the, um, like uh, the mundane, like of sending an email, for example, and you read this email and it made me think like, oh, there's so much like beauty in like the small mundane, like things that we do that we don't really realize in a sense. Um, it made me like appreciate the email that you were, that you were reading. <laughs> and so I think that there's really actually a lot of power in, in into that, like of just taking the time to like make every little thing that you're doing like uh, an intentional like uh, yeah an intentional thing that makes you yeah the, I, I think it was really interesting that you to I'm, I'm really also interested in look at in looking at the things that maybe you're not looking at them in the right way maybe you have to like just sort of tilt it aside and it becomes this really beautiful thing that you that notice so maybe you think it's taking the the traditional mundane things we do sending an email uh yeah the uh yeah sending an email is very traditional it's a traditional form of narrative right you you have a certain way you form your email it's pretty much always the same and finding a way to repurpose or adapt and modify this traditional narrative into a more what i called artistic expression so yeah <laughs> Megan, you want to add something about scaling up or not scaling up or scaling um, down? 
in yeah, what I direction? <laughs> or scaling think, a size? I don't know. The, I, I think I relate to what Beth was saying, how, well, it just has to be slow. Like, my process of making was slow, and it helped me really deconstruct and understand. I think as an industry needs to be slower, mm -hmm. and consumers need to also be slower. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it, um, it is. The question of time and temporality. Yeah, I... I feel like craft is not really scalable and or at, at a, like I don't think the point of my craft or like the craft of this jacket was to scale it up and produce it. I think the point was opposite to that. Mm -hmm. Was to make one yep. that's important and well made. Um and so I didn't really think of scalability in that way. Mm -hmm. no, but it not thinking about scalability is also a statement about the scalability of things. So it's really interesting whether you want to scale down, do it intimate, scale up, what are the potential, the difficulties. It's uh, it's really interesting. It, there's no good answers to that. It's, uh... mm. Well, thank you. And the, um, I, have a, I have a question uh, about, we, we spoke about sustainability the techniques of sustainability that are that are embedded uh, within your project and a little earlier in the other round table ali present <laughs> spoke about guilt okay <laughs> and and uh, and arnaud you, you, told, you told us you were ashamed <laughs> <laughs> but i'm just curious about what uh, whether it's a digital practice or or a material practice, it's a practice. Okay, so I'm curious about how important or not uh, is the question of joy when thinking about sustainability. Is it something important in the making process in at the end user process? Uh, is it something important at the experience level? Uh, or in those moments of ha ha that you have with your own things, uh, like is because was, we cannot always be uh, it was guilty. Yeah, <laughs> no. Well, also there's the difference between guilt and shame. They're yeah. not necessarily yeah, yeah, yeah. the same. Guilt is no. individual. Shame is um, collective, or it's brought on yeah. by the collective. So um, maybe Arnaud feels shame because he feels it from other people putting it onto him, or. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't know. And I don't know a lot today. <laughs> but it was funny because last night I was watching like a talk by Rick Rubin and he was talking about how you need to not consider demographics when you make art because you need to feel joy when you make the thing. And if you like, truly like what you're making, you love what you're making, people will come. So it's it's having to make things with joy and hopefully that is what will make it successful into the world uh, and usually um and i i think of these big industrial practices especially in graphic design i i think personally graphic design can be very shallow sometimes just because it is so industrial and commercial mm -hmm. uh, but breaking it down into something that you can enjoy and that you're really passionate about i think will it will translate into its success Mm -hmm. um i think the the question of sustainability is interesting just because that word has become has kind of like a nebulous meaning so in this context we're meaning like um environmentally sustainable but i think considering that um it's also good to think about and i think about this especially for myself and my own research is if it's sustainable for me to continue to do it like not in terms of um how much energy or resources am I using but just if I'm able to continue to keep doing something that's not like exciting or fun so I think um bringing it back to your question about joy I think that there does have to be those those moments or that that constant excitement throughout the process or else it's not really personally sustainable um mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely had fun with my project. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add that um, for me, like, I think 
when I feel ashamed or when I feel um, guilt, I'm paralyzed to do anything. So it's not something that I'm that I think is too helpful in terms of, of um, sort of pushing to action in, in, a, in a sense. It's 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 helpful to I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it like I think it, it can raise like important issues, definitely. But um, I'm trying to just try to like I I'm using a lot of humor and a lot of a lot of playfulness and even you were saying earlier and I think I sense like a bit of playfulness in your work where it's like because you were talking about like oh I know I never know where to put my coffee cup in the things and then it automatically automatically make me think of these kids toys when you try to put the right shape into the right thing mm -hmm. and then I, I was like why don't I feel this feeling when I'm throwing out like a, I want to throw something out in a couple of and I don't know where to put it why am I frustrated and why is it not like a game, a game in a sense? Yeah. Um, and so I think that by making something where you have to kind of pay attention to like something that's created and that's artistic, then maybe that will induce like some kind of pleasure into the experience. So that's how how I kind of see um, my work uh, in general. It's I'm not trying to make it like hey hoo -hoo, but i'm more it's more it's coming from it it's, it's more coming from there's an uncanniness also to my work like it's not necessarily like super joyful but there's definitely this sense of like um, yeah of playfulness and i think through change uh, that can provide change uh, meaningful yeah um i relate to that idea of the blocks like for kids because that's what it kind of looks like but uh in terms of uh, what you're saying um you were saying like uh you, you, your emotional reaction to them was negative right so um my thing is when i did the uh, surveys the number one emotion was neutral which was pretty interesting but it wasn't neutral right off the bat first they'd try something and then after they'd give up and at that point i think they settled on neutrality as an emotion mm -hmm. so uh, i think either emotion is good if you're joyful that's good and if you're frustrated that's good because at least you're engaged but if you're neutral, then it's like you don't even care. Like you're not gonna not gonna engage with whatever whatever that the design team is trying to the outcome they're trying to get. Mm -hmm. It's it's less likely if people aren't there's if there's not something emotionally engaging about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of what I did, there is comedy to it. But it would be interesting, like Junior was saying, if there was more emotional like reactions that you can have with these bins, maybe it'll it'll get some more engagement. I was about to say something uh, not funny, but <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> I'm curious to uh, hear you about the question of joy of making or not making and how important it is in terms of sustainability or sustaining your work. Um, definitely important for sustaining my work. I don't think I would do it if I didn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Like looking at this work uh, and what I learned from it and from the process, I think it's the joy of like, I want to share my tools with others and that gives me joy, like helping others and mending clothes for others and caring for others. Uh -huh. I think that's the component of joy more than the actual making. Yeah, It's more like how it's going to exist for other people and how it's going to build relationships uh -huh. and that brings the joy. No, interesting to see that as a kind of connection with with others, and um, that question of of joy may, maybe brings me to the question of ethics, and this is targeted to everyone, but maybe uh, I see it targeted differently to each of each and one of you. How do you engage with the ethical problem of your practice? Because every practice has nothing is perfect. Okay, nothing is a hundred percent perfect. It can like it can be a problem with the material that's inconsequent with the idea that we had in the beginning. It can be a problem with the system we're approaching. Is it even worth approaching it in the first place, and so on? So uh, I'm curious to hear more about like ethics in your work and where you position yourself as a designer or an artist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so working with technologies that obviously are very new and have like a bunch of ethical implications that are linked to them. Uh, what is nice about them, though, is that they are becoming really uh, accessible. 
So some people are actually using them. It's actually, it's it's becoming easier to not go directly. Like, for example, if you're looking for something on the internet, you could use Google or you could also use like a smaller alternative that maybe isn't as um like uh, hasn't a, that much of a big scope but still it, it's a little bit more ethical and mm -hmm. with these technologies like for example the the library that i'm using for machine learning for my project uh, they support like the blm movement and they're very like Im implicated into that and uh, so they i think it's easier now with technology to kind of orient yourself to kind of choose alternatives that are a little bit more ethical um, and in terms of that, I'm obviously using data of the people uh, that are interacting uh, with. And obviously, that's another ethical uh, uh, concern that I have. And um, I'm thinking of how to make that more obvious into my work. But uh, obviously, like the data is is deleted after the, 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 ex the installation is presented. Uh -huh. But I'm trying to make it also part of the experience where it's not necessarily like written somewhere and it's just like part of the the process of doing it but mm -hmm. we'll see so so all the pictures like of the faces are deleted after so yeah, yeah it's an interesting stance considering like this uh obsession with the uh, bio, yeah. biological metrics and the mm -hmm. quantified self and so on mm -hmm. oh, yeah. there's and i really think it's uh, interesting to have it stay there for like the 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 entire like part of the presentation because obviously it, it's it's also about the fact that our data is commodified and collected and so i think there's there's i don't want to make it like ethical in a sense mm -hmm. <laughs> because i'm actually trying to show that it's not super ethical so I have to play with that a little bit, but there is definitely, um, I, I actually don't, I haven't really spent that much time thinking about that. And I really should more like uh, there's a lot of media art artists that use data to in their, in their work. And I'm, I haven't really researched how they deal specifically with their data. So I, I have to really check that. I'm, I'm sure there's like a rule, like there's an ethical rules to follow in, in that uh, space for sure. But maybe there's not one framework, but that you can develop. Yeah, you exactly. Can develop your, your exactly. Own. Yeah. Anyone else wants to respond? Yeah. Yeah. So my project, um, and what I'm hoping to continue working on in the future is kind of in response to my, um, ethical qualms, I guess, with what I was previously doing because I studied before coming to this program. I studied architecture and worked in the industry a little bit and. I was interested in sustainable architecture, but I just felt that um, at the scale that it was being practiced at and with how much um, the building industry contributes to climate change through so many different avenues, whether it be like material waste, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and just transporting materials and things all over the world. Um, yeah, I didn't want to, I had a big ethical problem with just being a part of that practice. So mm -hmm. this is kind of in response to that scaling down, just looking at one specific facet of how could I maybe be more sustainable um, and more ethical in making. Interesting. And uh, I'm curious, Elizabeth, what is uh, in terms of ethics, because you made me think about the project. Uh, I don't know if the project has a name, but it was someone who did a TED talk, received a spam from a Solomon and decided to answer to the, the person who was sending spam emails. And it's a conversation that developed over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks uh, of like, hey, Solomon, what are you doing? And then they kind of play ping pong together. It's, it's, it's kind of a you know, there's a power game, but a lot of, of humor in there. And I'm just curious, like, how do you deal with, um, because you repurpose content, textual content, visual content that used to be project that are discarded. How do you deal with maybe the question of uh, uh, ownership? It's your files, but maybe the project also belong to someone else. How do you yeah. deal with that? Yeah, because yeah, technically the projects aren't mine because they belong to the 
the institution I work for, but I, I technically made it, but the, even the emails, the emails I didn't even contribute to, I just received them. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know about the ethics to that because <laughs> it's technically open, it's, it's not mine. Question, huh? I don't have an uh, answer, but I'm just curious if you, and then, uh, well, what I do, I usually never reply to my emails. <laughs> so that contributes to that. I don't add, I just look and I respond via the work I complete, but um personally I don't have any like solutions to it it just is how it is and you interact with just how things are but I do know some people like my boss he's developed algorithms to delete emails as they come or like if a email has a certain word in it like the algorithm will just uh, off it goes into the disposal and there's ways to kind of mitigate it in some ways um but no I don't really consider ethics that much no that's <laughs> just, a, that, that's interesting yeah. and, um, and if I do consider ethics it's a on a more a more larger scope of um wicked problems in relation to my work not necessarily like the medium I work with mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. I think it's interesting also to sometimes by and I work with that uh, also but like some people would think that it's would be happy that their email is highlighted and like in an exhibition and and but other people would feel probably like it's not ethical in a sense like like for me like uh, I, I like to play with this like I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the class like I brought we all brought objects for example and I brought this really weird like tube like this toy oh, yeah, snake <laughs> and we passed it around and it's really hard to keep in your hands because and it, it some people were really uncomfortable uh playing with it some people because they were in the spotlight and some people were actually <laughs> thought it was funny and like uh, wanted to like maybe take a picture or whatever so i think it's interesting also that in by just putting something like out there and like uh, I, I think people respond differently to that and mm -hmm. it can be it's in, it's 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 a weird question of ethic like of what is ethical and in, in terms of just like mm -hmm. existing <laughs> well yeah of course you have to narrow it down because yeah. it's, it's it's like the those those dolls that go inside the each yeah. other that's never ending i love yeah. those dolls yeah and asma do you want to add something about it it takes of making or the reason i ask is also because your title is about it takes of making so like, are you, how did you position yourself? Because it's interesting, you, you had the super critical reflection about the end user versus the system. How do you position yourself, say, uh, with regards to the materials that you use, PLA? Uh, I mean, it's just a question and there's no good answer. Uh, yeah, I'd consider the materials and stuff. At the beginning, I was like, okay, maybe I can do some resin type thing, but yeah. the quality is not gonna be the same, so like homemade resin i could have done the industrial resin but that's even worse than pla so um that would have been a issue in terms of biodegradability so I, I went with pla because it can biodegrade and the materials that it's made with are natural mm -hmm. originally so uh it has that versatility it's just it needs to be biodegraded in the right way um also you can recycle it so uh, like i brought those scraps um that's from uh, the models I made. I just, all the stuff that gets ripped off. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was going to bring that to the tech sandbox and they naturally recycle it. Yeah. So that was the, the plan for that. But in terms of like, uh, like the best ethical outcome, it's like uh, you have like hard choice and a harder choice. So you just have to do the best to, yeah. to try to pick between the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I mean, anyone who works with technology has to deal with industrial goods i guess uh, and the trade-off is always there yeah. there's nothing perfect it's, yeah exactly uh, yeah yeah and and megan what is uh you you started working with biomaterials you growing your own fabric your own substrate you switched to cotton um well for temporal material tons of reason which is perfectly fine i'm just curious how what is ethically important in your designs? Is it the, the cut, the no waste, the colors, the dyes, uh, the, the longevity? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, I think how I frame it, something that was important to me was um, 
in class, I know Noah talked about this, about how if you're creating to learn, you kind of get a pass because learning is really important, like mm -hmm. learning your craft. And I think that's how I treated my work with textiles. Like I can produce waste because I have to learn about it and learn these processes and how they exist in the world now and how I can challenge that. Um, so I think that was how I was more focused for this project. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about I'm graduating and textiles is something I'm really interested in. And am I going to go work in it? Because I don't think the fashion industry is ethical and mm -hmm. well in many ways. And some, that's something I'm grappling with. Can I work in the fashion industry in an ethical way? I don't think so. I think even ethical ways to dye, like I use eco dyes and I used a cotton that can be... Um, uh, can degrade naturally mm -hmm. but even then the way that we consume isn't ethical and the so yeah maybe increasing the longevity of the life of the product is an ethical way to think mm -hmm. about it but um it's something I'm grappling with and I don't know yet it's to be to be discovered um because I see the time is uh is running I would like to know if uh the audience has a question for our uh, presenters. Any question you'd like to ask the group? No? Yeah. There's any last question you'd like to ask the group? Mm. Not really. I, I was okay. really actually fascinated by all the, the yeah. answers. You gave to very important questions like the, the, <clears throat> the joy doing things. Yeah. I was thinking for myself, I'm, I'm really in a kind of nirvana there because I have joy in doing everything I do, and and uh, the joy is very simple joy because it's the joy to learn something every time. So that's my job. So that's why I say I'm in a nirvana because everything I do, being a failure, is a joy because I'm learning really something very important that doesn't work, or, or it doesn't work the way I want, but it actually works the way it should work. So this this kind of you know uh, discovery for me. Mm -hmm. you know, set me in a very good spot yeah. in that sense and the ethics is also a very big question and uh, it's also a too generic question i think uh, a trade is always there so it's really like you know how much you you have to give to you know to get something and uh, you know, uh, yeah and it's very personal you you will know you know within yourself you will know if what you're doing is ethical is right and maybe you know sometimes you ignore it but then it will get back to you and make you think again so it's a process too mm -hmm. but it's a really important question anyway that each of us should that all the time anyway yeah. no it's uh no words of wisdom the, the question of iteration and how things come back to you when they're unresolved and this will probably this question of unresolved will probably be my last question before the closing remarks. You know, when we do a project, there's always something unresolved, something we want to bring further or somewhere else, or something that we want to throw in the garbage and never touch again. <laughs> it, it happens. Thank God. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm just curious, what would have you done differently if you could within this semester? Could be one mini thing, could be a color, could be scaling up, scaling down, uh, changing an interaction button, um, doing research somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it could be anything. Um, I think it's also uh, just a new way to, because it's the first time that I'm actually building something that is both like, uh, that has like a material aspect and a digital aspect. And I wanted to add sound too, which I didn't have time to add. So I think I th I'm thinking of, it's new for me, like this whole process of having like the different realms of like, okay, I have to think about the digital, the physical, the material, the sound, like the experience, like it has to work not only um, technically, but conceptually. Yeah. Uh, um, and I think that I, I, I planned this project in a way that was a little bit too um, like a procedural. 
And I should have maybe started with something like smaller and build like or in circles around it, like a little bit of sound, a little bit of material, a little bit of digital, and then sort of like make that like grow at the same time. Because mm -hmm. right now I feel like there's a sound for me is just the thing that changes everything in an interactive experience. And I'm really sad that I didn't get to some sort of add some, even if we can't really like make it so loud here, I think it would still have added that. So I'm thinking of if I have to redo this process, not really jumping into like one part and then once that finished, like that part and more like trying to grow it like sort of a... Organically. Full... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that would be something that I would change, definitely. Uh, yeah, I would have liked to have done more photogrammetry with other people because mm -hmm. uh, it was just me, right? Yeah. So the idea was to include people in it. And so I had the surveys and I wanted to... I had some drawings of some bin tops, so I was going to print those. I didn't get a chance to do that as well. So I would have liked to have done something a bit more involving the users uh, and visualizing them as opposed to just me. And uh, yeah. Because gestures of wasting could be a whole series of, of characters. You know, what people look in front of the bin and like what how they engage with the bins with their buddies, that uh, could be a super interesting follow-up. Yeah. There was a lot of models on Thingiverse, but I wanted yeah. original content, yeah. so yeah. I didn't end it. Because there was like a lineup of people that I could have put on the bin, uh -huh. and I scrapped that, and I put myself just because yeah. it's more a unique. Inter but, no, that's an interesting yeah. avenue. Yeah. Again, what, what would you do differently if you had to uh, continue or bring that project in another, another direction? What could be the next step? Um, I'd like to, now that I have it, I think figuring out the pattern and how it was going to exist took me time. Uh -huh. Um, and now that I've done it in the traditional material and it, I understand like how it works and how it exists, I'd love to be able to redo it in different materials. Uh -huh. So I started using some waste that I sewed into it and I'd like to make all of the, um, the dark red pattern pieces basically in, um, different uh, fruit leathers i haven't started but that would be interesting i've seen that being done and also in um just uh plastic and paper waste that's insulated i think mm -hmm. that would have been an interesting thing too and just have different iterations of it and then actually bringing them outside yeah and wearing them. testing testing yeah, yeah. in, in the real functional yeah. garments yeah. and seeing how they degrade and what happens when they degrade mm -hmm. Seeing seeing them in the long term. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Elizabeth. Um, I'd say uh if I were to change anything, I would like to revisit the paper stock I used. Maybe try something um with recycled paper if I had the chance, but it's not always an accessible thing with uh like small local yeah. print shops, which is what I went with. Uh, and obviously I would have liked to make it much thicker, uh, make it look more like a book and less like a pamphlet. And also I'm, I'm still debating on this. I haven't like shown it to my colleagues if I should show it or not, <laughs> mm. show it to the people. To, to your colleagues involved in those projects? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could be yeah. interesting. No. How to do it. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of things that I would like to continue to test with this project, but I think um, if I had been able to get my hands on some other materials, like construction waste that I could have integrated, I would have liked that. Like I did look for like drywall um, and other things. I was like looking in like condos that were being built and in dumpsters, but there was nothing for me there. So yeah, I would have liked to incorporate some other materials as well. And also to make some like little objects that were kind of inspired by the materials, but I just didn't get that far um, with where the project is now. Yeah. But you'll have time to iterate. Yes. With more rubbles. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you to the five of you. Congratulations for your projects. Congratulations for your discussion, your generosity in the discussion. This is really, really appreciated. Uh, I hope those ideas travel differently in new projects and new endeavors. Um, this is the end <laughs> of the semester. Uh, I, I'd like to congratulate the first group that passed today, that discussed today. Um, oh, sorry, my mic is there. <laughs> Forget about it. 
I want to congratulate uh, the group from yesterday. Uh, it was as amazing, totally different. Uh, something that surprises me every year with that format is how different are uh, the visions, how different are the methods, how, how different are the brainstorms, the logistics, the way of working together, how everything unfolds. <clears throat> you know, when I start this class each September, uh, I'm always a little bit like, like a raccoon who sees like the cars arriving on the highway and the big light. And I'm just like, what's gonna happen this year? Oh my God. <laughs> okay. But it's always like that when you, you, the first week of class, it's, even if it's been many years that you teach, you're always stressed. And every semester of critical materiality, I'm always so surprised and so happy to see the, the original ideas, the original solutions, the, the amazing scenarios that you come up with that are sometimes more solution oriented, sometimes more speculative, some, sometimes more effective, sometimes more effective. But uh, I realized that as a professor, I learn every semester as much as you do. And that moves me a lot. So I want to thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, if uh, I will let Doc and conclude a few words. Sure, thank you. I'm just going to say thank you. It was just wonderful to have you all here. And also just about both days to see all these things come to life. Uh, we I've been able to do this last year and then again this year. And I hope to continue to do these kind of, just to have been able to see not just like, the projects themselves, the ideas, but have those materials and just see the, the just materials taken apart and put back together in ways that we would never imagine. Thank you again. We're going to close up the live stream, everyone on there. Uh, and don't forget, if you want to return, you can see, uh, which I was actually just watching earlier, and it's really nice to see some of the presentations from earlier in the day. Uh, feel free to share that. Thanks. Thank you. And I guess the sound is the Zoom. Uh... In the YouTube. Okay, so before you go, just so you know, your uh, PDF will be Monday. <laughs> no, sorry, I do this offline. <laughs> uh, but email me to have questions.